Hello and welcome to My Baseball History. I'm your host, Dan Wallach. My Baseball History is a long-form interview podcast where each episode I'll talk to someone new who has some sort of association to the game of baseball. No matter who I talk to, we'll talk about how they fell in love with baseball, how their career started, and how they got to be where they are today. Today's episode is the first of Season 3, which is sure to be our strongest season yet. A lot of you have reached out in anticipation of this new season, and we're sorry for the extended wait, but I promise you, you won't be disappointed by the interviews we have lined up for these next nine episodes. All of Season 3 and most of Season 4's interviews are already recorded, so you can count on a steady stream of episodes moving forward. A new episode will drop the second Wednesday of every month, so be ready. If you aren't already subscribed to My Baseball History on your favorite podcast app or platform, make sure to do that now so you don't miss out on what we have in store for you. On today's episode, I spoke with author and baseball historian Jacob Pomeranke. Jacob is the Director of Editorial Content at the Society for American Baseball Research, which you might know as Saber. He's been a Saber member since 1998 and is the chairman and newsletter editor for the Black Sox Scandal Research Committee, which has been at the forefront of some major breakthroughs and discoveries over the last two decades. Jacob was the editor of Scandal on the South Side, the 1919 Chicago White Sox, which was published by Saber in 2015, of the Eight Myths Out Project in 2019, and, along with Dr. David Fletcher, of Joe Jackson vs. Chicago American League Baseball Club, the never-before-seen trial transcript, which was published in 2023. Jacob has moderated panel discussions at the annual Sabre convention on multiple topics, including one on Chulis Joe Jackson, which he did during the 2010 convention in Atlanta, the 50th anniversary of Eight Men Out at the 2013 convention in Philadelphia, and the 100th anniversary of the 1919 World Series at the 2019 convention in San Diego. He was also a presenter at the 2023 convention in Chicago, speaking with Dr. David Fletcher about their newly released book. Jacob has appeared as a subject matter expert on baseball scandals on MLB Network's Triumph and Tragedy, the 1919 Chicago White Sox, on PBS NewsHour, on ESPN's Backstory, Band for Life, and on many other programs. His work has appeared in the Baseball Hall of Fame's Memories and Dreams magazine, in the National Pastime Museum, on Seamheads.com, and countless other outlets. Before he joined the Sabre staff in 2011, Jacob spent 10 years working as a reporter, page designer, and editor at the North County Times and San Bernardino Sun newspapers in California, and the Times in Gainesville, Georgia. In this episode, we cover lots of ground. Jacob tells us exactly what the Society for American Baseball Research is, and explains the many benefits of being a member. We find out what it was like to be a Braves fan living in Georgia in the 1990s, We learn how everything we thought we knew about the Black Sox scandal from Eight Men Out, Field of Dreams, and other popular depictions has been completely turned on its head in the past couple decades. And we hear how Jacob, Saber, and the Black Sox Scandal Research Committee has gone about actually doing the research to prove and disprove so much of what we've come to know about the 1919 World Series, the lead up to it, and the aftermath. With all of that information and much, much more coming at you, it may be helpful to follow along with the episode's liner notes on our podcast website. You'll still be able to enjoy the interview without the extra help, but sometimes when I'm listening to things like this, I like to really go in depth, so I've provided some photos and links to give you a better understanding of the things Jacob and I are discussing. Those liner notes can be found on the My Baseball History website, which is online at www.shoelesspodcast.com. If you want to follow along, head to the website where you'll see the Jacob Pomeranke episode listed first on the main page under Latest Episodes. Click on that and you'll be ready to follow along. There's an embedded media player right on the page so you don't need to have multiple windows open while you listen or fumble around with multiple devices. If you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, you can click on the tabs at the top of the website to go back through past episodes from any of the three seasons to date and see a full list of everything we have to offer so far. Everything in the liner notes goes in chronological order of how we talked about them in the interview, so you should easily be able to keep your place as you listen. After the interview, we'll do a recap of what you just heard, adding some extra insight and hopefully answering any questions that may have come up as you listened. So stick around until the end of the episode for that. But now, here's my interview with author and baseball historian, Jacob Pomeranke. So 
So you were born in Baltimore, Maryland, six weeks before Cal Ripken Jr.'s rookie season began in 1982. Tell me a little bit about what it was like to be a little kid in Baltimore. Well, the Orioles were the main game at that time. And so, you know, that's how I grew up as an Orioles fan with Cal Ripken and the Eddie Murray years. And my family was really into it. My dad was a big Orioles fan. My grandfather had been living in Baltimore in the 1960s following that dynasty. And so I grew up hearing stories of the old Orioles and, you know, kind of immersed in Baltimore baseball. And we went to the Babe Ruth birthplace when I was a kid and, you know, Orioles games at Old Memorial Stadium. And so it was just, you know, baseball was a part of my life from... I mean, literally before I even have memories, baseball was a part of my life. I do not remember my first game because it was too early. I, yeah. You know, I was too young. And so it was just, it's always been a part of my life and it has, you know, ever since. Cal's consecutive game streak began on May 30th, 1982 and lasted through September 19th, 1998. So you were 16 and a half years old before you consciously lived through a day when Cal Ripken Jr. was not in the Orioles lineup. Were you an Orioles fan as a little kid, or was that too early for you to have really been paying attention and forming opinions on baseball teams? Was it just like, yeah, they're the home team, so that's the team I watch the most? You know, it was mostly they were the home team. They were literally on a channel called Home Team Sports at the time. And, and being able to follow the Orioles, you know, again, they had just come off the World Series in 1983, which I do not remember. And, of course, I don't remember <laughs> the early days of Rip and Streak either. But it was always part of the conversation. It was always, you know, my first season as a baseball fan was 1987. That was, you know, just a fun year in baseball, the rabbit ball, the home runs and everything. And of course, the 87 tops, I was collecting baseball cards at that time. Uh, so it was a great time to be a baseball fan. It was a great time to be an Orioles fan, too. I mean, the Orioles weren't that good in the late 80s. But, you know, by 89, they got good again. And that's the year that we moved down to Georgia and started becoming an Atlanta Braves fan as they started getting good in mm-hmm. the 90s. But no, you know, growing up in Baltimore was great being able to be that close and have baseball so accessible. And that's something that not everybody gets to enjoy. And I've been able to enjoy it really all my life, going back to the earliest days. Your mom got you to eat carrot cake as a kid after she found out it was Brooks Robinson's favorite cake. So is it safe to say that you've always kind of had a reverence for the history of baseball and its players? Yes, you're digging very deep there, but... Uh... It's question number three. We haven't even, <laughs> we haven't even scratched the surface yet. <laughs> but yeah, no, that was uh, that recipe from Brooks Robinson's wife was in a Hall of Fame magazine uh, back in the 80s. And I decided that carrot cake was my favorite type of cake <laughs> because it was Brooks Robinson's cake. So yeah, my mom used to make that for me as a kid and she still will uh, on request. But... Uh, same recipe uh same recipe Amazing. absolutely yeah. she's 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 adapted to it she's written in her own notes but no it's the exact same recipe and so yeah no it's uh like i said baseball has been kind of embedded in my soul in all ways i mean i was always the baseball kid i was always the baseball guy growing up and that was always part of my identity i mm-hmm. guess in small ways and in big ways so your answer might be a little skewed from what, what like the general person's answer to this question might be, but I've always kind of wondered what it was like in Baltimore during the mid to late 80s in terms of what ball players from the city's past people really cared about. You know, Brooks Robinson's career ended in 1977, so were people still super into him or had they already kind of fully transitioned into Cal Ripken worship mode? And also, you mentioned going to the Babe Ruth birthplace. Was that something that was general knowledge to people in Baltimore or was that like you had to be a really specific type of baseball fan and historian to know about that and appreciate that, that that was part of the Baltimore city history as well? Yeah, I think that was something that was more known to baseball connoisseurs. You know, I think the birthplace opened in the early 80s. It kind of got restored uh, around that time. And so it was part of the revitalization of downtown, the Inner Harbor. Harbor Place uh, complex opened up in 1981. And so it was really just part of that revitalization that culminated in Camden Yards a decade later. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it was all that well known outside of really strong baseball circles. But that was the circle I was in. My dad and my grandfather were were both very very into this and so when my grandfather would come up from Florida you know this is where he wanted to go sometimes so we went pretty frequently cool. and yeah it was just a very very small museum and there's not a lot of space to hold many artifacts but it's fun it's mm-hmm. baseball it's Babe Ruth it's obviously Americana you've got all of it there yeah. and now you have Camden Yards a couple blocks away and so it's part of the culture of Baltimore baseball and Baltimore baseball history and and like I said I was you know steeped in that from the very beginning yeah And the artifacts that they do have are really cool. I was there a couple years ago, so definitely a trip worth making if you are in the area. So then you mentioned when you were seven in 1989, you moved to Oakwood, Georgia. 
pretty great time to become a Braves fan. Your favorite pitcher of all time was? Tom Glavin. Yes. I was left-handed and breathing, so uh, <laughs> I became a pitcher too. And, and 1991 was uh, my first year as a pitcher in Little League and coincided with Glavin winning the Cy Young for the first time. And was he your favorite player bar none, or was he just your favorite pitcher? Was he just your favorite Braves player? Definitely favorite pitcher. You know, Cal Ripken has always been my answer to favorite player, mm-hmm. but Glavin was my favorite pitcher. I could not throw very hard. And so, you know, I was probably the only nine-year-old in the world with a circle changeup, um, <laughs> which wasn't much different from my fastball uh, then or now. But, uh, you know, it, it was fun. It was a great time to grow up in Georgia and grow up with the Braves because obviously they got good in. 91 and then you know forever after um they've been pretty good and you know just having them on tbs every single day which was not a given at that time not every team's games were on tv every single day back then it was mainly the braves and the cubs and occasionally the mets and so you know being able to watch them every day and follow that team and then of course as they got better and ended up going to the world series it became just a huge phenomenon in the atlanta area and so you know i was wrapped up in that and you know that was something that all sports loving kids uh, in that area around that time were just loving the Braves. You said that some of your absolute favorite childhood memories were being woken up or getting permission to stay up late to watch big sports moments. What is your best Braves memory, whether it was in person or not? You know, there's, uh, I, I have so many from that era. One that stands out was in 91. It's probably still my favorite team of all time, the 91 Braves, even though they did not win the World Series that year. That season was just so special and so memorable and so many great moments. And so there was a, a late season series in August in Cincinnati where they uh, came back against the Reds. The Reds were the defending World Series champions at the time. And they came back. They were down 6 nothing in the first inning. Came back, won it on a Francisco Cabrera home run off Rob Dibble in the ninth inning. And the day before that, my cousin was getting married up in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, there was a rehearsal dinner. So we went to not the Cabrera game, but we went to the game before that in 91. And uh, back in those days, you could get onto the press box level or get close to it. And Harry Carey and Skip Carey uh, always had this tradition of name dropping fans that were from the local area. (laughs) And so we passed a note into the Braves broadcast booth and Skip Carey read our names on the air. You know, hey, we're in town uh, from Georgia and we're, you know, here at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. And when I got back to school the next week, um, (laughs) you know, I'm in the fourth grade. I got back to school. I was a celebrity for approximately three and a half days. Um, That's a good three and a half days. Right, exactly. And so, you know, so so that was just a fun memory of that season and being able to see that team during that year. It was just, you know, it was a lot of fun. What has been your worst day being a Braves fan? Ooh, that's a tough one, actually. Um, you know, I'm sure there's probably some baseball answers to that. You know, there were some low years in the late aughts after the dynasty years ended and after all the players started leaving and retiring Mm -hmm. there's probably some baseball answers uh you know i would say though it's from more of a a big picture answer as a braves fan it's just watching the team embrace the tomahawk chop you know and continue to embrace that over the years that's something that you know i've called for publicly and obviously privately to as just one fan Mm -hmm. this is something that i stopped participating in i you know i did it as a little kid we all did in the early 90s but that's something that that you start realizing, oh, yeah, that's not right. And so, you know, seeing the team perpetuate that, seeing the team move into a new stadium a few years ago and continue to do that when they had every opportunity to start new traditions. Yeah. You know, that's something that it's hard to watch and it's hard to, you know, there's no defending it. You know, now I'm still a fan of the team, but, you know, there's no defending it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's something that's hard. And, you know, to watch them in the playoffs, especially in the World Series, you know, in 21 and and see them continue to do this and see the fans do this on national TV over and over again. That's hard. It's, yeah. it's hard to watch. And, you know, we've all gotten into that as sports fans and know there's things that you have to accept and things that you can't accept. And, you know, for me as a growing up as a Braves fan, that's something that's like, hey, no, this isn't right. And, I wish this team would do more to stop it. I don't know that there's necessarily anything that individual fans can do other than say, yeah, I'm not going to participate in this and I'm not going to be part of it. But, uh, 
it is tough to be a Braves fan and watch that continue. Well, it's one of those things where it's been so embedded into the culture of that fandom that even if the stadium didn't play the sound effect to get it started, you know that fans in sections would start it and the whole stadium would, obviously not every single person, but for the most part, the whole stadium would join in. But for the stadium to continue playing the sound effect, that's what gets me. Yeah, I'm of the opinion that if the team wanted to stop this, they absolutely could. I think the quote-unquote official encouragement by playing the drums and even, you know, what they were doing a couple years ago when the St. Louis Cardinals pitcher called them out and they were not, they were no longer playing the music, but they would beat the drum like once or twice Mm -hmm. and then all the fans would start. You know, it was just this not very subtle cue to start chanting and the team doesn't have to do that. They can stop that at any point they can play seven nation army like every other stadium in the right. world you know they, they can do literally whatever they want it doesn't have to be that but they want to and they don't right. want to alienate those fans and the reality is the fans are just following their leads you know there's idiots in every fan base they would continue to do it but it would die out very quickly mm-hmm. and you know in the same way that it started very quickly it wasn't always part of the culture they weren't doing that in the 70s i mean they had the mascot chief nakahoma and all that but mm-hmm. but they weren't doing that kind of stadium-wide stuff. I mean, that started with Deion Sanders in the 90s, and it it can end whenever it wants and whenever the team wants to, and they're the ones choosing to perpetuate that. Which was first? Was it Florida State doing it, or the Braves doing it. It was definitely Florida State. It was definitely. So is that why the Deion Sanders connection, right? Exactly. That's yeah, yeah. why he did it was because he was a Florida State alum. And yeah. that's what they did down there when he was in college. And so when he came to the Braves, you know, he wasn't doing it in New York as a Yankee <laughs> right, right. Um, in the 80s. But when he came to the Braves and, you know, started getting a lot of attention as, you know, a multi-sport player. In fact, I believe it was in 91 when he was leaving to go to the Falcons training camp. He had played with the Braves in the spring. Mm-hmm. And when he was leaving in July to go to the Falcons training camp and leaving the team, his last appearance, I think he homered. And as he was, you know, running off the field, he gives a little chop to the fans. And that's how it really got started in Mm -hmm. 91. And so it doesn't have to continue. It's, you know, the tradition is not even as old as me. So it it can stop any time and the team can choose to stop it whenever they want. They just don't want to. Yeah. You went to the University of Georgia. What did you study in college? And when you were in school, what did you think you wanted to do when you graduated? I was uh, in the journalism school for a little while and working at a at my local hometown newspaper in Gainesville, Georgia, and eventually was working for them full time uh, even while I was still in school. And so, you know, once I had figured out I'm not going to continue on playing baseball, you know, writing about baseball seemed like the next best thing. That's kind of a classic sports writer's uh, mm-hmm. path. You know, I was very interested in covering sports and writing about sports and just, you know, being close to the game in that way. And that seemed like a simple path to keep the game in my life, even though I wasn't going to play it much mm-hmm. anymore. So getting into journalism was was kind of the next best thing. And, and I've always kind of had the mind for that, you know, and always, you know, I've kind of been a news junkie uh, most of my life, always wanting to know, you know, and, and learn more. And so that was a path that made sense to me. It always did. And, you know, UGA has a great journalism school uh, then and now. And so it was, you know, kind of a a simple path to get there. And and Athens, you know, was about 45 minutes away from where I grew up. And so it was nice. And and at Georgia and and then working at the paper, that was really my real education uh, was working for the newspaper and covering Mm -hmm. high school and college and occasionally pro sports. You know, I was a, a kind of a backup Atlanta Falcons beat writer for a season or two and, you know, ended up covering youth sports, ended up covering outdoors uh, for a while. I'm not a fisher or a hunter, but I covered it for about two years and learned a lot and learned about the people who do it and got to kind of immerse myself in the journalism world. And that was a great education because that was, you know, you, you don't, you don't really get any cheat sheets. You just got to dive in and mm-hmm. make mistakes and, and, you know, learn on your own and get better every time. And, you know, every story that you write every day helps you get better. So that was uh, just, you know, really fun learning experience. You've also been a dues paying member of Sabre since 1998 when you were just 16 years old. When do you first remember hearing about Sabre? Actually, the way I heard about it was the uh, 1997 Sabre Convention was in Louisville, Kentucky, and that's where uh, my relatives live, and uh, we used to go up there a couple times a year to visit family, and so 
I was up there in the summer of 97, but I was not a member of Sabre. You know, I didn't really know much about it, but that's, you know, where kind of the seeds were planted. And so as a Christmas gift, my parents got me a uh, Sabre membership that December. And so joined up in 98 when I was in high school and started getting the magazines and started learning more. And, you know, for a long time, I was just a consumer. I was just, you know, somebody that was interested in reading the magazines, reading the newsletters, learning about the research committees. Uh, back then they had something called the Sabre Research Exchange, where where you could send a self-addressed envelope and they would send you back old articles that was on a list of like 4,000 articles. And, you know, one of our, our members, uh, Len Levin up in Rhode Island would kind of manage this and he would, you know, photocopy an article. And so I found, <laughs> you know, Shoeless Joe's, uh, you know, grand jury testimony that way. And I've started getting into the Black Sox and finding articles that were being published in magazines in the 90s about the Black Sox. And so I started, you know, asking for those and, cool. uh, and getting them. When people hear about Sabre, a lot of them assume, oh, it's just those Sabre metric nerds who come up with those crazy statistics. And yes, that is part of what Sabre is and does, but it's so much more than that. It's about uncovering and documenting and preserving the history of the game in many ways and forms. There are multiple committees within Sabre, including the Ballparks Research Committee, the Baseball Cards Research Committee, the Baseball Landmarks Committee, the Deadball Era Committee, Negro Leagues, Women in Baseball, all these committees... What is the goal of those committees and who are their members? Yeah, so, you know, the research committees are kind of one avenue of, of Sabre involvement. You know, that's a great way if you really are interested in the research and learning more. The research committees are a fantastic way to get involved, to learn more, to dig deeper uh, into a specific subject matter. You know, so some of the ones you listed, like that is their sole focus. And it's, you know, any member of Sabre can be part of these committees. You know, I'm, I'm a member of uh, probably eight or 10 myself of subject matters that are of specific interest to me or, you know, just something I want to learn more about. Mm -hmm. And any member can sign up. Any member can choose whatever level of involvement they want. It's also a great way to kind of get involved and to be more active, you know, and obviously the Black Sox scan was something of major interest to me. And, and so once that committee got formed, it was a great way to kind of have a little bit of a leadership role. And, and, you know, I started producing the newsletter back when Gene Carney was the founding chair of the Black Sox committee. And so I, you know, had some involvement and that was something that I had not been doing much in Sabre. I had mostly just been reading, you know, what everybody else was doing. And mm -hmm. this was a way for me to get involved. And, and that was just really cool. There are also multiple ongoing projects being championed by Sabre and its members. One of those is the Sabre Bio Project. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, so the Biography Project is probably the most ambitious uh, project Sabre has ever created. And the goal is to write a biography of every single person who ever played in the major leagues or the Negro Leagues. Um, and there's about 24,000 players right now. And we have completed over 6,000, so we're about a quarter of the way there. And it's possible we might never get all the way there because <laughs> they keep adding new players every season. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to keep trying. And it's really cool because it's not just the baseball careers. It's not just, you know, what they did on the field it's also the stories of their early lives and off the field and their post career and what they did as human beings and it's cradle to grave it's a story of their entire lives and it's really fascinating because in in many many cases the saber bio project is the only place you can find detailed information on somebody that played four games in 1919 right. or just had a cup of coffee with the red Sox in the 60s and the bio project is it that's the only place that their stories are really told you can find their stats in lots of different places but their actual stories of their lives um the bio project is it for you know and that's not true for the you know henry aarons of the world and the Babe roots of the world you can find their stories everywhere mm -hmm. there's dozens and dozens of books written about players like that um, but out of the twenty four thousand people who have ever played there's only a few hundred guys like that if that many. Yeah, exactly. You know, and their stories, yeah, you're, you're not necessarily going to rely on the bio project for that. But yeah, the, the person who played a handful of years or maybe they were an all-star 50 years ago and nobody quite remembers them very well. Mm -hmm. Those are stories that you're going to find out about. And what's cool about baseball is these stories continue to have relevance now. And something happens, you know, Shohei Otani does something cool. And we find out, oh, this is the first time, you know, since... Tungsten Armo duel or whatever, <laughs> right. um, you know, like, like we find out more about players that did things in the past because it's relevant to what players are doing today. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things that's so awesome about baseball is that there are so many connections between the past and the present and the future. And so, you know, the bio project is just one way to connect those dots and say, Hey, here's a story of somebody you may have never heard of, but they did something cool. And now, you know, now you have learned more about this person that you may not have ever heard of before. 
After the Negro League players were integrated into the white Major League's record books, roughly how many extra players did that add to the all-time list of people to play Major League Baseball? I believe it was uh, a little over 4,000 players who were added to our biographical database in Sabre. Seamheads.com has really the most comprehensive database of Negro League's players, both the biographical details and also their playing careers as well. And so that's kind of the main primary source that Sabre uses, that Baseball Reference uses, to put together the stories of, of the Negro Leagues. And, you know, obviously there were players who kind of went back and forth between the white minor leagues and major leagues and the black major leagues. And so, you know, there, there's a little bit of over, there was always a little bit of overlap. And now that the records are a little bit more combined, it's, uh, like I said, it's about 24,000 major league players overall, including the Negro Leaguers. And I think mm-hmm. there was probably about four to 5,000 players in the Negro Leagues who did not appear in the white major leagues. Interesting. You've written more than 10 biography project bios yourself, including those of notable 1919 Chicago White Sox players Fred McMullen and Claude Lefty Williams. How many words is an average bio? Because for a guy like Henry Aaron, there's a lot more to say than a guy like Moonlight Graham, you know, a guy where he was up for a cup of coffee, like you said. What is the average length of these bios, and do they vary greatly depending on the life and career of the player? We generally try to keep them between about 2,000 and 4,000 words uh, for the most part, but there are exceptions where a player's story is so compelling or so interesting that we may go a little bit farther, 6,000, 8,000. There were some in the early days that were closer to 10,000. I believe my first draft for Fred McMullen was about 12,000 words. Um, we had to basically cut that in half to get that in the Scandal on the South Side book. But yeah, about two to 4,000 is generally what we're looking for. And I will say there are different challenges depending on who you're writing about. It's because if you are writing about Henry Aaron, the research is the easy part. Mm -hmm. You know, finding information on Henry Aaron is not hard. The writing on that one is much more challenging because to distill Henry Aaron's life into 4,000 words is almost impossible. And so the writing on a Henry Aaron bio is much more challenging than the research. But that's the opposite problem when you're writing about Fred McMullen or, you know, some of the other lesser Black Sox players, you know, from 1919, you know, Lefty Sullivan, I wrote that bio, and, and Joe Jenkins, the backup catcher. Um, in that sense, the research, it's much harder to find out, you know, these missing questions that probably no one except their families have ever asked right. um, to find out, you know, where they were, where where they grow up, you know, what are their families like, trying to find members of their families, relatives, you know, that can be challenging as well. So the research on that one is much harder than the writing. And so, you know, there's challenges in telling anybody's story, but, you know, that's part of the fun in it too. And when you're reaching out to living family members of players who died a hundred years ago, what is the reception? Are they like, why do you want to know, like, this is weird, leave my family alone? Or is it like, they're so thrilled that somebody is trying to preserve the history of one of their ancestors, especially if it's a guy who only played a couple weeks or a couple months? Like, what has the reception been when you've gotten in contact with people? It's much more the latter. It's much more, you know, wow, I can't believe someone's actually interested in my grandfather or great-grandfather or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, that is overwhelmingly the reaction. Uh, you know, you, you will see with some of the Black Sox family members, um, whether they knew the actual Black Sox players or not, um, which fewer and fewer do as time passes, you know, you will see a little bit of hesitation. You know, certainly I have tried to contact and, and have contacted some of the children of the eight Black Sox players, and some of them are very resistant to talking to any researchers or, you know, talking for interviews. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's totally understandable, given the notoriety of their relatives. Uh, It's totally understandable to have some skepticism about what is the true motivation? What, you know, what are you, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you you get that reaction occasionally, but overwhelmingly the reaction is, wow, I can't believe somebody's actually interested in my grandfather or whatever. And I think that's a lot of fun because you can find out so much really interesting information about them as people, you know, because, again, the, the baseball stuff is easy to find. The baseball encyclopedias have been around for generations. Right. And so finding out they, you know, had 87 hits in 1922. Okay, great. You know, that's not hard. But finding out, you know, this guy likes a you know, cup of ice cream after dinner every mm-hmm. day, you know. And then, or like he had the, typhoid fever. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. You know, and that's the stuff that not all of it is interesting enough to include in a biography. But it can lead you down the path of finding out some really cool stories um, about those people. And, and that is a lot of fun because, you know, some of that information 
has remained buried, you know, with them. And so digging that out again and finding out, hey, these are living people. This is living history. People remember these players. You know, people grew up with these players. And so being able to find out what they were like as people and as ball players, I think is really just fascinating. And I think that's why the Bio Project is so popular and, and just resonates with so many people is because, you know, these are the stories of your grandfathers and your great grandfathers and your great grandmothers in some cases. And being able to connect those dots, you know, as, as living history, mm-hmm. I think is just, you know, it, it's fascinating. Similar to the biography project, there's the Sabre Games project. What is the goal of that one? So that one is kind of a complement to the bio project. It's, you know, a way to tell stories about individual games, specific games, and not just famous games, not just World Series games, but, you know, other historically significant games. And, you know, we, we also delve into the minor leagues and college baseball and international baseball and you name it. You know, but the goal is not to write a, an article about every game that's ever been played, is it? No, yeah. that's, uh, that's probably a little, <laughs> probably a little much. Uh, but we're definitely trying to tell stories that have not been told before. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, you know, a driving force of the committee leaders to try to tell stories that, again, have remained under the surface. And there's, you know, significant games, there's games that connect the dots to today. Um, and we want to tell those stories. You know, we, we definitely want to tell stories of like individual Negro Leagues games, because those are stories there's just not that much information about. And in many cases, they were not covered at all by the white newspapers. And so, you know, it is hard to find. And there's been so many great black baseball researchers over the decades that have dug up a lot of information. And so being able to tell these stories and put them into historical context is something that you can't always get. If you're reading a biography of Satchel Paige, you're not going to find out more about individual games. But, hey, we can write a story about you know him playing a game at Yankee Stadium mm-hmm. and being able to set the scene and put readers in Yankee Stadium in 1936 or whatever. Like Those are stories that are just fascinating and, and really do a good job of connecting those dots of history of, you know, this is what it was like on a day-to-day basis to watch Satchel Page, rather than, you know, hey, here, here's this full story of this Hall of Famer. That's great. But here's what it was like on that day. Here's what it was like to be a 10-year-old kid in the stands at Yankee Stadium and Satchel Page is on the mound or Josh Gibson's behind the plate. Um, those are stories that, you know, have not always been told. And so, you know, we're trying to tell a little bit more of those stories, too. And you have personally written more than 15 games project stories, including more than 10 from the 1919 season alone. How does someone sign up to write a story for either the Games Project or the Biography Project if that's something that they were interested in doing? The first thing is to be a Sabre member. Um, any baseball fan can join. There's no test. Just pay your dues and uh, and you're a Sabre member. And so if you want to get involved, you can contact the uh, Games Project committee leaders. They've got some uh, a series of frequently asked questions uh, to how to get involved. But, you know, if there's a game that has not been written about uh, on our website, you know, you can uh, contact the Games Project leaders and say, hey, I'd like to write about this. And they'll send you some author guidelines and, and help you out. You know, we've got a great team of volunteer editors and fact checkers who will help make your story better. And so we've got some research resources to help you get started. So yeah, we've got a lot of people who have never written for publication before. You know, and this is a really fun way to dip your toes into the baseball research world. And you know, the the Games Project stories are um, a little bit shorter than the bio projects. They're generally around 1,000 or 1,500 words. So it's not very daunting. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and if you write about a game that you saw or, you know, your first game or something like that, generally you can, you know, you've got your own memories and then you can supplement that with research and, and tell that story. And all of a sudden you've got a published clip so this yeah. is something that we love to promote as you know a way to kind of develop that itch of, of research of writing you know if you want to get into it if you want to you know build clips for your resume that's something that I did when I was uh, younger and you know adding this stuff to your resume I mean this is trying to help people do more and, and you know get more out there it's a, a fun way to do that you keep talking about being a Sabre member, what does that really mean? Well, you know, I think the most important thing is that, you know, you're part of this community of Sabre members. We call ourselves, you know, really the most passionate and most knowledgeable baseball fans in the world. It's a group of people who share like-minded interest in at least one thing. You know, you can go to any Sabre gathering, big or small, two people or 2,000 people, and you're going to share something in common 
with everyone there. And that thing is baseball. And, and you're going to find that everybody's got a, a story. Everybody's got something that they're interested in. You know, And again, you don't have to be a researcher. You don't have to be a writer. You don't even have to have any interest in getting involved in that stuff. I mean, for me, I spent many years just reading baseball stories from other people. And that was great. And, uh, you know, I could continue my entire life and still get a lot out of Sabre just by reading all the free magazines and books that you get, you know, as being part of your Sabre membership. And, you know, if you want to get more involved, you absolutely can. We, you know, we have opportunities for conferences and for local events and regional events, you know, and so there's ways to get more involved, whether it's from a community standpoint or a research standpoint or what have you. Um, there's other ways to get involved, you know, and, and you can kind of take it as, as far as you want, but you can also just sign up, pay your dues, read the free books and the magazines and the newsletters and be happy. And that's a pretty fun way to be a baseball fan too yeah and you're gonna learn a lot i guarantee you that and that's one thing about saber that you know has always been uh, so fascinating to me is i am always learning something from somebody i always thought i knew a lot about baseball and then i joined saber and realized oh wow there's a whole world out there of things that i do not know anything about mm -hmm. but man there's a lot of people who do yeah. and that's awesome because i'm always learning something somebody's got a passion somebody's got a niche and they want to tell that story and it's like okay this is cool you know i had no idea and let's talk a little bit about the local chapters as well there's over 65 chapters in the u.s and more than a dozen more internationally if someone is interested in starting a chapter where they live how would they go about doing that and once they do what does a local chapter do yeah, so the local chapters are, are basically driven by the local members. All you really have to do is be a member of Sabre. And if there already is a local chapter in your area, great. You know, you can sign up for announcements and, and you know, learn about what they're doing. And some of our chapters meet more in person. Some meet more virtually on Zoom. Some have kind of a, a hybrid mix. As things go on, you know, as time passes, you know, chapters are going to find new ways to connect. You know, it's a great way to kind of be part of your community in your local area. And, and again, find people that share a like-minded interest because if you move to a new area and you don't know anybody you know join saber join a go to a local saber chapter meeting all of a sudden you know you've met some people that share an interest with you you know mm -hmm. and that's a great way to meet people too so you know and, and again uh, some of them you know hold bigger events and and you know they're more elaborate and you know all day you know meetings with guest speakers and research presentations and things like that and some of them just find a bar and go watch a baseball game you know on a thursday night or whatever once a month and so you know it's great because every chapter kind of fits whatever its local members want out of Saber membership in the Saber community. And so every chapter is a little bit different and some are more active than others. And if there's no chapter, you know, you can start one, you can, uh, you know, petition the board of directors, say, hey, I want to start a chapter here. And the board will send you back or one of the staff members will send you back, you know, a, a list of people who are in your local area and get in touch with them and see who, who else might uh, also be interested in doing that. So it's not hard. And, and I think we're over 80 uh, regional chapters around the world now. So it's a really cool way to just, you know, be part of the community and find people who share that interest with you. Definitely. So your official title is Director of Editorial Content at Sabre. What does that mean? <laughs> I wear about 18 different hats, yeah. and uh, as do we all on staff. And uh, So you know, what does an average day look like for you? Whew, there is no average day. I can, I can guarantee you that. Um, every day is a little bit different, and there's always something new and something fun and you know something we're working on. So um, we've got a staff of four full-time people, the CEO, and, and then three of us on staff. And every day is a little bit different. We, we've got different programs that we're you know, ongoing or, or that we're trying to get launched. You know, We've got our conferences. Uh, throughout the year that take months and months of planning. And then, you know, for me as the editorial director, the primary part of my job is managing the Sabre website, managing the editorial content that we produce on a really on a daily basis and just kind of organizing those projects. You know, I work very closely with all the research committees with what they're doing and they might put out their newsletters. They might have a, a website project that we're organizing or designing. I work closely with the bio project and the games project to get all those stories published online. We've got a great team of volunteer editors. We've got some people who volunteer with helping out with the website as well. I also manage the student interns that we have throughout the year as well. And so we've always got different people that are involved in different ways, mm -hmm. helping to produce all this stuff. Cause you know, it, it takes a village. It takes a community of people to do all the stuff that Sabre's doing. And so it's always a lot of fun though. There's always something new. And on top of doing all of that, you're also the chairman and newsletter editor of the Black Sox Scandal Research Committee, which we kind of touched on earlier, which helps some of your contributions to the games project and bio project that I mentioned earlier make a little bit more sense. 
What is entailed in being the chairman of one of the many Sabre Research Committees? Yeah, so, you know, I have been the chair of the Black Sox Committee since 2010, and a big part of that role is just kind of finding people who are interested in the Black Sox story and also helping to make people interested in the Black Sox story. Um, and you know, Which one, one is easier? Um, I think finding people who are already interested is, is harder, uh-huh. um, although there's more than you'd think. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've been really blessed in the last two decades of having so many new sources of information, so much new information that's out there that we're able to put together. And it feels like every couple of years, something comes up and it's like, wow, this is something that we had no idea was out there, whether it's the legal transcripts or the salary cards at the Hall of Fame or, you know, the film footage that came out of the 1919 World Series. I mean, there's always something, you know, just this past summer, there was a time capsule at the Tribune Tower in Chicago. Chicago that was unveiled and it turns out that one of the items that was placed in the time capsule was a 1919 World Series baseball that was authenticated by the sports editor of the Chicago Tribune and so you know there's always something new and you know of course now we've got sports gambling and everything so there's <laughs> so there's a lot of relevance to the Black Sox story now and so in some ways it's almost like this flood of information and you're just trying to piece it together and just trying to put the context together of, you know, Hey, here's why this story is important. And so, you know, a lot of my job is answering questions, whether it's from students, from journalists, from researchers, from college students or professors, from me, from you, (laughs) um, you know, whoever has a question about the black Sox scandal, thankfully, our Sabre committee generally has the answer or can point you in the right direction. And so, you know, I kind of serve as, as a point person on that. And, you know, if I don't have the answer myself or if I can't help you find it, I can definitely help put you in touch with people who can. And so that's a big part of my role is saying, oh, you've got questions about the legal aspects of the Black Sox scandal. Well, hey, we've got just the person for you. Bill Lamb wrote an entire book about that subject. And one thing about Sabre members is just they're always so, so generous with their time with their expertise, with their research. I've had questions and I've gone to a Sabre member and say, hey, I'm looking up something on the 1910 Trolley League in Southern California because Fred McMullen happened to play there for like two months, a hundred years ago. And a Sabre member who I don't even know will respond and say, hey, here's all this research that I've done for like 10 years. You can have it all. Here's photocopies of all of it. Yeah. It's like, oh, Wow, this, this is incredible. I've had that happen dozens of times, and I try to do the same. I try to be generous with my research, and if you're working on something that intersects with something that I've already done, here it is. Mm-hmm. Here's you know I've got it organized in, in folders in the cloud. Here it is. I'll give you the whole thing. I'll give you all of it. I want to be generous because so many people have been generous with me, and that's something that within our committee, it's great because... We've got different people who are interested in different areas of the Black Sox scandal. And so if I have to call on them for a question or for information or for some article from 1923, somebody's got it. Mm -hmm. If I don't have it, somebody else has it. And so it's great because you've got these people, you've got this community of people that are all interested in the same subject. And we can generally ping ideas and questions off each other. And if we can't find the answer, that means the answer probably can't (laughs) be found yet. And so it's great because we've got people who know enough about different areas because I admit I do not know everything about the Black Sox channel. Nobody does. Mm -hmm. But I say one thing about the position that I'm in is that I can at least help you find the answer or point you in the right direction. And, you know, and I think that that is one of the great values of Sabre and the Sabre committee in general is that we can help point you in the right direction at least and, and start you digging on that path. Over the course of the last century, there have been dozens of books, movies, articles, poems, plays, podcasts, about the Black Sox scandal and the people and the players involved. When was the first time you remember becoming aware of it? Well, you know, I I watched the movie Eight Men Out when I was a kid, and I, I don't remember that much about it. The first time that it really ever sunk in was when I was 16 years old. That was the same year that I joined Sabre. We were on a road trip to Florida to visit my grandparents, and I picked up the book Eight Men Out and uh, started reading it and just became so enthralled with it. I read it cover to cover and, you know, it was... Had you already seen the movie at that point? um, I believe I had seen bits and pieces of Mm -hmm. it on TV, but I wasn't paying that much attention to Mm -hmm. it. It was, oh, it's a baseball movie, but I wasn't paying that much attention to it. So I I did not know that much about the story. I knew about Say It Ain't So, Joe. I knew about Field of Dreams, but I I didn't know that much about the story. It was Mm -hmm. not something that I had been seriously interested in until reading the book. Amen Out, the book was the thing that just the light bulb went off in my head and by the time I finished reading that book 
I had more questions than answers. I wanted to know more. And, you know, there was that scene at the end of the Eight Men Out movie in which Shoeless Joe was in New Jersey and Buck Weaver, played by John Cusack, was supposedly in the stands watching him. And that was the scene that stuck in my head. And there's a part of the the Eight Men Out book that kind of talks about that scene as well. That was the scene that just triggered everything in my head. And it was like, okay, A, did this really happen? Mm -hmm. Did Shoeless Joe play in New Jersey and was Buck Weaver in the stands to watch him? And the first question is, yes, he did play in New Jersey. And the second question is, no, Buck Weaver was not there. Buck Weaver was out in Wisconsin or Illinois playing with the other Black Sox at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was not known to me at the time. That was something I had to dig hard to find. But, But that was the scene that was like, wow where's the rest of the story? And, you know, I had so many questions about how this scandal happened and who were these guys and, you know, all this. And so we started digging and I ended up meeting Gene Carney and, and other people who were involved in the Black, what became the Black Sox Committee and Sabre at the time. And we had a email listserv on Yahoo for years and years and years. And we would just fire questions back and forth. So I started meeting more people who were interested in it. And just the more we learned, the more questions we had. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> it was just... Just went deeper from there. And uh, that was, you know, 24 years ago. And I still am, I still have more questions that I'm trying to find the answers to about the Black Sox scandal. In 2015, Sabre published a book that you authored and edited called Scandal on the South Side, the 1919 Chicago White Sox. What made you and the other contributors to that book feel like something new was warranted when so much exists out there already? So the big reason we did that book was because we had already been doing a lot of research, but it was not really in one place. There were bits and pieces of information. Bill Lamb had written a great book about the legal aspects of the trial. The salary information was starting to come out. That was in a different magazine article. Myself and Bruce Allardyce and a few others had written stories for Sabre magazines about the Black Sox scandal. And so it was all in a bunch of different places. We had been doing really good research for about a decade and it was all in different places and it was in different books and different articles. And so there was not this kind of one place to find information about the players and the scandal and every, and just compile it all in one place. Because the reality is at that time, people were still answering the question of where do you go to learn about the Black Sox scandal with eight men out? Right. And we knew that wasn't true or accurate any longer, but we also didn't have a good answer for where do you go to start? Yeah. And so that was a big reason why we wanted to do that book. First of all, let's tell the stories of the players, not just the Black Sox, but the Clean Sox as well. And, and you know, Charles Comiskey and Harry Grabner, the GM, and all the people involved on that team and tell the story of their season and tell the story of the World Series and the scandal. And there was not that one place. And so we said, well, let's do this and let's do this through the Sabre Digital Library Publishing Program. And we're going to tell the stories of all the players. And that's a large part of the book is biographies of the players. But it's also, you know, summary of the season, essays on the season and the World Series. Fantastic chapter by Bill Lamb just summarizing kind of all the new information. And and here's what we know now about Mm -hmm. the Black Sox scandal. And that article has been reprinted many, many times in in different publications, including an anthology of Sabre's best work over the last 50 years. Just an outstanding chapter just kind of summarizing hey here's what we know now here we've got all these little pieces floating out there but here it is one place and so ever since that book came out in 2015 our answer has been start there yeah you can dive deeper we're going to help you dive deeper and there's a dozen other great books that we can point you to but start here this will give you a good base foundation of knowledge about the black sox scandal and then if you're really interested well, here's a dozen more right. <laughs> you know, that, that we can help point you to. So, that's... And what are the specific areas within the story that interest you? If you are interested in the legal stuff, Bill Lamb's book is where you want to go next. Yeah. And if you're interested in like the human aspect, you know, there are so many different ways you can dive deeper. But that Scandal on the South Side book will give you the basis of like, all right, what interests me within this story? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and that's something that our committee is so great about is there are so many different angles to this. Yeah. And, you know, we do have people that can hone in on the lawyers, that can hone in on the gamblers, that can hone in on the baseball side of things. And so we've got really good stuff for all of those angles if you really do want to dive deeper. But what we didn't have, the void that existed at the time was oh, I've seen Eight Men Out, or oh, I've seen Field of Dreams. I want to learn more. You know, where do I begin? Well, Mm -hmm. start here. And then 
if you want to dive deeper, we can definitely help with that. But you got to start somewhere. And for my money, that's the best place to start. I am obviously very biased, but, uh, <laughs> but it is really the best place to start. In 2019, for the 100th anniversary of the Black Sox scandal, Sabre published the Eight Myths Out project, which aimed to shed light on the eight biggest myths about the fixing of the 1919 World Series. I have physically held some of Gene Carney's personal research notes in my hands and found that as early as 2002, he had written in his notebooks the beginnings of this project that he had titled Eight Myths Out. Tell us a little bit about Gene Carney. You've mentioned him earlier, but who was he and why is he so important to the Black Sox scandal? So Gene Carney was the founder of the Black Sox scandal committee in 2008 is when the committee uh, first formed. But he also started our, our email list serve back in 2003 on Yahoo. And he had been writing about baseball for about a decade or so before that. He had a, a little newsletter that he would mail out. You know, this is before the Internet in the late 80s, early 90s. He would mail out to couple hundred subscribers and it was you know essays it was poems it was research articles um little things that he was interested in he was a big pittsburgh pirates fan mm-hmm. the 1960 world series was kind of the pinnacle of his baseball fandom and so he had so many interests and at some point in the mid 90s late 90s uh he really got interested in the black Sox scandal and and just started diving deeper and the great thing about Gene was he just had this such an inquisitive mind. And so if he had a question, he was going to dig as far as it took to get the answer. And so he started digging up. And this is, you know, again, back in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, he started digging in. And the, there's not a lot of places to find great information. You've got to go to libraries. You've got to go to the microfilm. A lot of things have not been digitized yet. And so he started digging in and he started building this community of people who were interested. I eventually became one of them and I joined the email listserv in 2003, 2004. You know, and I'm 21 years old at the time. And, you know, I, I've done no baseball research of any consequence. <laughs> I had helped with a series on uh, Mill League baseball for my hometown paper in, in Gainesville, Georgia. We had kind of a team that helped with the research on that. And, and we did a story on Shoeless Joe Jackson and the rumor that he had ever come to my hometown, which he did not. But I had done no baseball research of any consequence. I was a nobody. And Gene welcomed me in and welcomed in hundreds of other people just like me because we were interested and because we just wanted to learn more. And so he was always, always so friendly, so welcoming, and so generous with his time. And you cannot beat that type of of spirit to make you feel good about just being part of that community. And, And he built up this community of people that eventually became the research committee. And it went on from there. And he was, for a long time, he was kind of the fulcrum of what people were doing. And his book came out in 2006, the Burying the Black Sox, about kind of the cover-up of the scandal in, in the 1920 season. And, you know, as soon as that book was published, he was already at work on another one. And he was already at work on new projects. Before he died in 2009, uh, he went on a cruise to Alaska with his family. And literally the day before he left on the cruise, you know, he's emailing a few of us with questions about the Black Sox. <laughs> you know, when I get back, here's what, you know, I want to do. And it just he overflowed with excitement, enjoyment, and generosity. And so... It was just a lot of fun to be part of that community. And, you know, if I can be half as generous and half as friendly and welcoming as Gene Carney to the people who are interested in Black Sox now, I, I will consider that a success. Okay, one last question before we actually start getting into the myths themselves. For everyone who's skeptical about all this new information that goes completely against what they've heard or seen for the past hundred years that turns the plot of their beloved movie Eight Men Out on its head... How did you guys do the research to uncover the truth to all these myths? I know on the Sabre website, you have links to all the supporting documentation for each of these myths for anyone who wants to do further research. But how do you literally go about finding new evidence for events that happened 100 years ago? You know, a lot of it is just you're digging for something and all of a sudden you're in a tangent and you find something else and it just leads to a different thread and a different thread. And only rarely are you looking for something and you actually find it when you're doing (laughs) historical research. Most of the time you're looking for something else and you stumble upon something. And if you're lucky, you realize the significance of what you found. And it's like, oh, okay, this is something that I need to take a note about or, you know, take a photo or a scan of and file that away because that might prove to be the missing link somewhere. But are Um, you literally going through newspapers from 1919 and just like, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and I'm going to start reading this Pittsburgh newspaper because who knows, maybe they're going to talk about something like physically. How are you reading stuff? Sometimes that is exactly what happens. It's like you have to start with a question. Mm -hmm. You have to start with, okay, this is something that I don't know the answer to. How do I 
find out? Well, you're going to have to start somewhere. So whether that's a newspaper, microfilm, or increasingly digitized online, Mm -hmm. you have to start somewhere. And it might be in the library and in archives, census records, you name it. So you have a question, you start digging for it. And as you're finding out a little bit more, as you're piecing together a little bit more of the puzzle, you start generally coming up with new questions or tangential questions about that subject. And so they're saying, okay, I need to look up this person's parents. I need to find out when they were alive or where they were living or whatever. Um, And so now all of a sudden you're in census records and okay, now I need to find an obituary. So you're digging in another newspaper, you're digging in genealogical records somewhere. And so you start building these pieces, but it all starts with a question. It all starts with, okay, I'm trying to find this out. How do I do that? And what is the best source to start? And then as you start digging, it's like, okay, well, here's a few other things to help piece this together. And then part of the challenge of not only the research, but especially when you're trying to publish the research is, okay, what's important, what's significant, and what can I leave out? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of researchers struggle with kind of notebook dumping uh, Mm -hmm. is probably what we call and just, I found it and therefore it's important and I have to put it in the article. And it's like, no, it's not significant. You know, it's, it's, and it's not answering the question. And you're it's not answering answer. the, yeah, it's not yeah. answering the question. And I think that's, you know, you have to always go back to, well, what is the question I'm trying to answer? Stick with that because, you know, you might be able to have a different question. You might be able to use that piece of information down the line. That's why it's important to be organized and take good notes and most importantly, be able to find the research that you've done in the future because that is actually one of the hardest parts is, oh, I found this cool thing where was it right or what page was it on or what was the date or what library was that in and saber does a very good job of making sure you always cite your sources well if you've forgotten where you found that you can't use that so Mm -hmm. you need to make sure at the time you're doing the research oh yeah here's what it is and so you know i've got my own filing system that i've been using for many years trying to organize it all and more importantly being able to find it again oh yeah i did that three years ago where is it now (laughs) you know and i've got you know boxes and file cabinets at home trying to dig this stuff up i've you know digitized a lot of my research files now too Mm -hmm. so that they're a little bit easier to find and you know that has been a, a great part of researching in the 21st century is being able to have this stuff digitized. You can go to newspapers.com or ancestry.com and there it is. And you might be able to find it again uh, if you've lost it. And like you said, not just easier to find, but then easier to share because you've got everything in the cloud and absolutely separated and organized and all that kind of stuff. So So if somebody else has a question, you can point them right there. Here, Here it is. Okay. So let's talk about all of these myths, which you guys have thoroughly debunked. The first one, which is essentially the central thesis of the book and the film Eight Men Out, is that the Black Sox players threw the 1919 World Series because they were so poorly paid and mistreated by White Sox miserly team owner, Charles Comiskey. How did this become a myth in the first place? So, you know, the myth actually stems from the criminal trial in 1921. This was one of the theories that the defense lawyers for the Black Sox players came up with, basically trying to get their players uh, off the hook. They were throwing out all kinds of theories, and some of them stuck, and many of them did not. But one of the ones that stuck was that the reason that they were motivated to do this was because they were so poorly paid. And poorly treated by Charles Comiskey and that Charles Comiskey was at fault. But that was just one of many theories that the defense lawyers were trying. That was not even one they they even considered all that serious. But for whatever reason, it stuck. And that became, you know, one of the guiding principles for why did this scandal happen was Charles Comiskey was Scrooge. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, the players had no choice but to throw the World Series because they were so poorly paid. And it turns out that's not anywhere close to the truth. So tell us the truth. What was the actual case? So the truth is there's two parts to the truth. The first one is the salary information, which we, you know, have documented contract cards now at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And the truth is the White Sox were one of the highest paid teams in baseball. They started on opening day in 1919. I think they were the third highest paid team. And by the end of the season, the Red Sox had been shedding salaries. And so they were the number one payroll in the American League. They were the best paid team in baseball. And that's not just the Clean Sox, which Eddie uh, Collins and Ray Schalk had good salaries as part of the Clean Sox. But some of the Black Sox did as well. Buck Weaver was one of the best paid third basemen. You know, Shoeless Joe Jackson, um, there's been a lot made about his salary. But, I mean, he was second among all AL players at his position, only to Babe Ruth of the Red Sox. So. Right. 
Eddie Seacott was the second highest paid pitcher in baseball behind Walter Johnson. I mean, all of that is very commensurate with their talent levels. And, you know, whether they knew that or not, I think is open for debate. Mm. But the reality is they were paid very well for baseball players of their time. Now, that time was the reserve clause, and they had very little negotiating power. And the 10-day reserve clause rule was uh, in their contract. Teams could release them or trade them at will. And so they did have grievances, absolutely. But uh, as far as the salary information, we know now that all these numbers that have been thrown out for many years are just wildly inaccurate, including the ones in Eight Men Out. I believe one of the claims in Eight Men Out was that Eddie Seacott was being paid half of what Dutch Ruther, the young Cincinnati Reds pitcher, was making, which isn't even close to the truth and actually caused Dutch Ruther to threaten to sue Elliot Asinoff when that came out in 1963. He's like, well, where did you get that? Mm-hmm. That's not even close to the truth. So we have the salary information. So that's one part of the answer is that these guys were very well paid uh, for baseball players of their time. And then the second part of the answer is the motivation for why they did it. And and the reality is only rarely did they ever cite Charles Comiskey as having anything to do with the scandal. This is not something that the players themselves said had anything to do with it. They were not motivated by Charles Comiskey. Again, this was a little bit of a defense lawyer theory, just throwing it out there, seeing if it would stick with the jury. The reality is it was greed. They wanted the money. They wanted easy money. They thought they would get it. They thought they would not get caught. And even if they got caught, they thought they would not get punished because Hal Chase had been caught fixing games with the Reds two years earlier by Christy Mathewson, one of the pillars of the game at that time. And Hal Chase wasn't even punished. Mathewson caught him red-handed and even Hal Chase was not punished. So they did not think there was any threat of getting caught or getting punished. They thought they were going to make an easy score, possibly a year or two years of salary for one week of work, and then they would go right on and play the next season and play out their careers, and nothing would ever happen to them because nothing had ever happened to anyone that they knew, Mm -hmm. including Hal Chase, one of their former teammates for some of them. And so they thought they would get away with it. They thought it was an easy score. They thought it was a low-risk proposition, and that's why they did it. There were some rumors out there about the Chicago Cubs possibly being bribed to throw the 1918 World Series. There's very thin evidence that that is true, but the White Sox players might have believed it. They certainly Mm -hmm. talked about it. They Mm -hmm. said they talked about that rumor. That's how they came up with the idea that $10,000 was the number to shoot for. And that's why Eddie Seacott asked for $10,000 because that was the rumor going around that that's what the Cubs got. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, there's no evidence that they ever did throw the World Series in 1918, but that was the rumor. And so... But there's also speculation that the 1912 World Series was thrown, that the 1905 World Series was thrown. I mean, there were games as far back as 1865... That were thrown. So, like, there is such a long history of baseball games, and this is another myth that we will later debunk. But this was not the only time that this happened. There, there was such a culture around baseball of games got thrown, and it wasn't a big deal. And not just games, but specific at bats would get thrown, or sometimes entire seasons would get thrown. So, this was something that they didn't think was gonna be a big deal. Yeah. No. And and again, nobody had ever really gotten punished for it, and even the ones who had gotten caught nothing ever happened to them. And so the White Sox did not see this as a problem. And and yeah, they had grown up, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but they had grown up betting on their own games. That was very common. It was wide open. Players would talk about this. They would be quoted in the newspapers talking about betting on their own games or betting on other people's games. That was extremely common. Mm-hmm. One week before the 1919 World Series, Trish Speaker and Ty Cobb fixed a Tigers-Indians game at the end of the 1919 regular season. This was widely known. Right. <laughs> you know, became a mini scandal a decade later when it became more public knowledge. But like, you know, they fixed the game. There's no doubt about that. If you've ever wondered why Ty Cobb finished his career with the Athletics instead of the Tigers, exactly. that's why. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, this was part of the culture at yeah. the time. Sports journalist Hugh Fullerton wrote in the New York Evening World on December 17th, 1919, about the end of a two-month secret investigation by detectives hired by Charles Comiskey. Comiskey had even publicly offered $10,000 for anyone to provide, quote, legal proof that his players were not trying. Hugh Fullerton reported that the investigation had been unable to find evidence that there was dishonesty among the players of his team during the recent World Series. Do you know what they were specifically looking for or if they were actively legitimately looking for anything? Or was this all just a PR move by Comiskey to be like, look, I did everything I could and everything came back clean? I would say it was 90 percent a PR move. Mm hmm. And it was 10% looking for information that he did not yet have so that he could figure out what he wanted to do with it. I do think there was an element of 
let's talk to people who might know things so that we can either squash it, which is what they really wanted to do, or so that they would have some piece of collateral to deal with the situation Hmm. if it became public knowledge, which is what they didn't want. And so I I do think there was an element of let's find out what we can, but it was 90% a PR move of, hey, we investigated and we found nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. You know, every company does that forever and ever. Right. And this is what the White Sox were doing. They were, you know, looking out for themselves. Comiskey was looking out for himself and his team. And he found the information that he already had. He knew that his own players had thrown the World Series. You know, he I mean, knew before the series started. He knew before the series started. And that's also in our myths that we'll get into a little bit more detail later. So there was nothing that he needed to find that he didn't already know. Yeah. But he did hire the detectives because in case there was anything else that he did not yet know, he might be able to find out. Mm-hmm. And that way he would have the edge. He would have either the collateral to say, oh, yeah, I've got extra pieces of information or I've got something that we can help squash. Mm-hmm. And I think there there was that almost sincere element to the investigation, but it was mostly, let's say we did and didn't. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the myth. So the second one is that Charles Comiskey ordered pitcher Eddie Seacott benched down the stretch to avoid paying him a $10,000 bonus if Seacott won 30 games in 1919. Now, he finished the season with 29 wins, which looks suspiciously coincidental at face value. So how did that become a myth in the first place? So, again, this was part of the rumors that were flying around and part of the defense lawyer's theories that, you know, this is why Eddie Seacott got involved is because Charles Comiskey wronged him. This was a theory thrown out by his defense lawyer as a possibility. But this rumor had actually been in print earlier. And in fact, as early as mid-October of 1919, about two weeks after the World Series ended, there was a gambling publication called Collier's Eye that printed this exact theory that Eddie Seacott was promised a bonus for winning 30 games. And so it's possible Seacott was telling people that. It's possible that this was just a rumor among gamblers. We don't exactly know the origin story of that. What we do know for sure, what we can document, is the types of bonuses that Charles Comiskey actually paid to his players, including Eddie Seacott. And the bonuses were not even remotely close to $10,000. You know, that would have been more than Eddie Seacott's base salary. That would have doubled Eddie Seacott's base salary. I don't know about you. I've never had a boss that doubled my salary with a bonus. I also worked in journalism and never got bonuses. (laughs) But, you know, that's not what bonuses are. Bonuses are not 200% of your salary. That's not how it works. And the bonuses that Comiskey did pay were closer to $500 for Mm -hmm. winning 20 games. Lefty Williams had a $250 bonus, I think, for winning 15 games and a $500 bonus for winning 20 games. And that was off a base salary of of somewhere in the neighborhood of $3,200 for the season. So $500 bonus, $3,200 salary. That was documented contractual bonus that was paid to Lefty Williams because he did win 20 games in 1920. And so we know the types of bonuses and the type of bonuses that were promised supposedly to Eddie Seacott aren't even remotely close to the bonuses that were actually paid in that era. Mm-hmm. So there's that part of the myth. And the other part of the myth is that he was benched, that he didn't win his 30th game. And he was benched, but that was by his own request. He had complained about a sore arm. He was 36 years old. He knew he was going to be used very heavily in the World Series. So they sent him home to Detroit for two weeks when they had a seven or an eight game lead in the standings and they were coming close to clinching. And so they sent him home. They eventually did not clinch the pennant. They kind (laughs) of had to call Seacott back. And he uh, went into a game against St. Louis Browns. He pitched seven innings. And if they had won that game, they would have clinched the American League pennant. And Seacott gave up five runs and seven innings. He didn't pitch very well. And uh, he got taken out for a reliever, and the White Sox rallied and ended up clinching the pennant on Shoeless Joe's walk-off single. And by then, Seacott was out of the game. He did not factor in the decision, and he only started one more two-inning tune-up start a couple days later. And so he did not win his 30th game. But But he had multiple opportunities to do so. Yeah, if he had pitched a complete game shutout and won that game five to nothing, he would have won his 30th, and there'd be no question about it. He just didn't pitch well. So, And, you know, he may have legitimately had a sore arm. He pitched 300 innings and 36 years old, and uh, he knew with the best of nine World Series he was going to be relied on heavily. So that's a lot of workload for a 36-year-old arm. But, yeah, the bonus had nothing to do with the scandal for sure. And another thing that's clear up, we are 100% confident that you pronounce his name Seacott. 
Yes. Yes. One hundred percent. He said it many, many times. There were articles written. Ring Lardner wrote a poem about it that was printed in in one of the newspapers. Uh, it was always Seacott. There are branches of his family, other relatives, not in Michigan, who pronounce it Seacotty, and possibly in a couple other variations too. But his family and Eddie himself always, always, always Seacott. That was never in doubt. During the criminal trial in 1921, Seacott actually had to get up and address the judge because so many of the lawyers for both the prosecution and occasionally the defense were pronouncing his name differently. And he wanted it for the record. <laughs> I pronounce it Seacott. Please, everyone use Seacott. Yeah. So we know that 100% for sure. Okay. So the third myth is that the naive, undereducated ballplayers were conned by big city gamblers to throw the World Series and quickly got in over their heads. How did this become a myth that people believed in the first place? So this myth actually does originate with Elliot Asinoff and Eight Men Out. This is really an Eight Men Out misconception here because before that, for about 40 years before that, the standard storyline of the Black Sox scandal is that the Black Sox were basically just crooks and you know they were greedy they were crooks they were out to ruin baseball and that was kind of the storyline that got told eight men out flipped that that was a little bit of revisionist version of the story and part of the reason for that is because Elliot Asinoff had been a former minor league baseball player he had been treated very poorly as a minor league player and so he was kind of in the throes of this kind of leftist politics in the early 60s. Also, the Major League Players Union was starting to gain some steam in the early 60s. And so labor versus owners, that was a, a big part of the, the culture or starting to become a big part of the culture in baseball at the time. And so this was Elliot Asinoff's storyline was that big bad Charles Comiskey, him against the lowly players. And so in a little bit of an effort, you know, there's some grains of truth to the undereducated part of this, but as an effort to kind of create this clash between big bad Charles Comiskey and dumb, naive players, this is kind of the story that he chose to tell. And he, so he emphasized the fact that Shoeless Joe was illiterate, which he was, mm-hmm. you know, and he stopped going to school and by the age of six or whatever. And so he emphasized these facts, which, you know, again, some of them were a little bit true. And the reality is, you know, Shoeless Joe was a very smart man, a very shrewd businessman. He just couldn't read or write. That was not that uncommon at the time, Absolutely. especially in the South. And so, you know, he emphasized this myth. And so th- that became the storyline is that the players had no idea what they were doing. They got suckered in. They got seduced by these big New York hotshot gamblers, Arno Rothstein and Abe Attell. And, of course, Abe Attell was Elliot Asinoff's primary source for the Black Sox scandal and for the eight-man out story. It was Abe Attell, this no-bit former boxing champion, but this two-bit gambler that was a known liar. You know, and couldn't be trusted at all. Abe Attell was his primary source for this. And so Mm -hmm. Attell has a good reason to make himself look good and make, you know, oh, yes, we were the heroes of this story by bribing the players. That was Attell's version of it. And the reality is, no, actually, it was the players who did this. It was Eddie Seacott's idea. Chick Gandle was heavily involved in this. They were the ones who went out and recruited the players first. And they also recruited the gamblers. You know, they started with Sleepy Bill Burns. They started with Sport Sullivan. They were trying to get as much money as they could. It was their idea. And they were the ones who hatched the plan, set it in motion. And then, you know, even during the World Series when everything was blowing apart, they were the ones who got back in it and figured out a way to get paid even more. So, yeah, it was the player's idea. And that really throws the eight-man out thesis on its head because you can't just blame Charles Comiskey. You can't just blame the reserve clause or whatever. Whatever. the players did it <laughs> right know? and there's really no doubt about that i mean there's degrees of guilt between all of them but there's really no doubt i mean they came up with the idea they executed it and and it was calculated they went after the guys who they were friends with yeah. you know sports sullivan a Patel, sleepy bill burns they were all former athletes themselves so they kind of hung in the same circles as these guys or they had already known them personally yeah and that's how they knew hey this is a guy who can get us money so that's how they chose to go after these guys and uh you know, it's part of the fun of doing this research and traveling around the country is a lot of these ballparks don't exist anymore. You know, Fenway is still standing, but that's it at this point for the American League ballparks. But some of the hotels where these meetings took place do still exist or the buildings do at least. You know, so Hotel Buckminster in Boston, which is where the first allegedly the first meeting may have taken place. There was Hotel Sinton in Cincinnati, which is torn down, but the site still exists. So 
it's been fun traveling around the country and going to see these places and walking the same routes that <laughs> these players and gamblers walked and being in the same room. So that's been a pretty cool thing. What about the groups from Iowa? Not too many people know about those guys. Who were they and how did they have such a large influence on gambling in the World Series being in such a relatively small city that much further west? So, you know, it's interesting because, yeah, you're right. That story is not well known. It's not really included in 8 Men Out, and it's not really included in too many other versions of the story since then either. But the reality is there were a lot of gamblers involved in this whole thing. It wasn't just Abe Attell, which is what Abe Attell wants you to believe. He had friends, and he he didn't have the money, and Mm -hmm. Arnold Rothstein would not originally give him the money to help finance this. And so he had to call on his friends, and he knew David Seltzer in Des Moines, who was a big part of almost every meeting with the players. You know, these guys in Iowa, in St. Louis, in Pittsburgh, possibly in New Orleans. They owned businesses, successful businesses. They owned racetracks in some cases. They were doing well. They had some money. Did they have as much as Arnold Rothstein? No. Did Rothstein probably put up most of the money that actually made it to the players? I do think that's probably true, although there's so many different versions of the money trail that I don't know that we're ever going to be able to solve. But the Iowa gamblers put up money as well, and they definitely put up money that made its way into the players' hands. And these were friends of Abe Attell. They roomed with Abe Attell at the Hotel Sinton in Cincinnati. We have the hotel records to show that they were rooming together. All these gamblers, like six gamblers in one room, um, you know, and, and I think four of them were from Iowa. So, like, it's incredible how many people knew about this and, and the fact that it was such a open secret and, you know, and not only among the gambling world, but also the baseball world and, and how many people knew that the White Sox were on the take and that these gamblers were, you know, they were all trying to get as much money as possible, whether that was through winning bets or, uh, you know, being bribed. And so, you know, it's incredible to, you know, we're, we're only now starting to learn more about the different syndicates of gamblers and where they were and what their stories were. You know, we're only now identifying who some of these gamblers were. Um, and that's something that we're working on in our Sabre Black Sox committee is, you know, identifying who the gamblers were because they often used aliases and they often kind of kept in the shadows or had kind of these underworld connections that weren't reported on and weren't documented very well. And Sport Sullivan, you know, big man from Boston, we did not have an obituary for him until probably 10 years ago. Interesting. Um, Nobody knew when he was born or died. And so we're just starting to find out, never mind the fact that, you know, he lived and died in Sharon, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston, and he never really hid himself. He was always there. So it could have been found a lot earlier, Mm -hmm. but it was never printed in any of the Black Sox books. And we're only now finding out more about his life and the fact that he was, you know, in 1903, he was trying to bribe Cy Young, you know, and, and being cited by newspapers in 1914, 15, 16 as the main Boston gambler. And right. he would help set the lines for the World Series, Benny Nods. There was an entire section in Fenway Park where the only people who sat in that section were gamblers, right? Yeah. To the point where Major League Baseball had to come up with a rule that said, Players could not interact with spectators before a game started because they knew the conversations that were happening were about, I want you to throw this at bat in the third inning, or I want you to make an error if your team's up by five or more, you know, like, or $5 to get a hit right here, you know, or $5 to strike out this batter or whatever. I mean, these, yeah, these were conversations that were being had and they were so wide open. I mean, the really field bleachers were the same way. I mean, it was wide open betting. It was not hard to find a bet, Mm -hmm. um, you know, on anything on, on the next pitch. And yeah, the Red Sox, I mean, this was a huge controversy, especially when Harry Frazee, uh, the theater owner bought the team. He was very welcoming to the gambling contingent. And basically, yeah, the whole uh, grandstands behind first base out into right field were full of gamblers. And that's, you know, they were throwing money back and forth all game. Um, You know, this again, this was wide open and reported on in the newspapers. And so... It was a huge uh, source of controversy in Boston because Van Johnson, the American League president, was really mad at Harry Frizee for not clamping down on this and not occasionally not even hiring police, not even hiring security uh, to patrol the ballpark. This was a huge thing. And this was one of the many reasons why Van Johnson wanted to kick Harry Frizee out of baseball. But the gambling was a a big part of that because it was rampant. Is Arnold Rothstein given too much credit or, depending on how you look at it, too much blame for the fixing of the 1919 World Series? I mean, he was the guy who essentially bankrolled everything, but was he the one making moves behind the scenes to set the plan in motion? Or was that all of these other small-time guys doing the real legwork here? 
Well, you know, Rothstein intentionally created a cloud of mistrust, not only with the people he was working with, like Nat Evans and Sport Sullivan and A. Battell, people he knew personally. He was also intentionally creating confusion as to what his role really was, how involved he really was. And, and as a result, there is still a lot of misinformation that, you know, we might never clear up because the reality is he probably took it to the grave and there's nobody on earth that actually knows. Why would he have been creating that confusion? Because if everybody knew that every game was being bet on and gambling wasn't a big deal, who cares? Well, I, I do think there's still the ethics of it, you know, and, and boxing and horse racing, you know, had had even more problems with fixed matches than baseball had. But, you know, I mean, if the integrity of the game is threatened, you know, you're, you're not going to have fans. You're definitely going to lose something. And that's something that, again, boxing and horse racing have had forever. Mm-hmm. And baseball had made a concerted effort not to have that problem. And they had the Louisville scandal in, in 1877. And, you know, obviously the World Series had been threatened by bribe rumors going back to the first modern one in 1903. So baseball had had tried hard, and so the gamblers knew that. They weren't trying to take down baseball. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't want to ruin baseball. He wanted to make money off baseball. Right. And so, you know, it behooved Rothstein to say, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just making money. That's all. Mm -hmm. And it behooved him to not have his name out there because he was a well-known figure in gambling circles at the time. And and certainly in New York City, he was well-known. And so he didn't want his name to be part of it because as he knew, and, and he was very shrewd about this, if his name was part of it, then he would start to lose control over Mm -hmm. the fix and over the plan. And so the more that he could keep Nat Evans in charge kind of from a day-to-day level of operations or a Battelle who he didn't trust very well and who was much more of a loud mouth, you know, the more he could keep other people as more of the face of the scandal or what became a scandal, the better for him it would be. He could just Mm -hmm. make his money and get out. That's what his goal was. He just wanted to make his money and get out. He wasn't looking to be the hero Mm -hmm. like Abe Attell was. And so it made sense for him to say, no, I had nothing to do with it. And when these guys approached me, I turned them down. I didn't want anything to do with it. You know, he was approached by a lot of people for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And so he had plausible deniability to say, oh yeah, I had nothing to do with it. And yet behind the scenes, we know for a fact he was actually sending out people like Nat Evans, his own business partner, you know, right-hand man, Mm -hmm. um, a guy he trusted very, very well. You know, he's sending Nat Evans to go meet with the players. So we know he was involved and we certainly know that he put up some money. But for him, it made sense to say, oh yeah, publicly I had nothing to do with it. You can't prove anything. Mm -hmm. So the fourth myth is that Before the final game of the 1919 World Series, White Sox pitcher Lefty Williams was threatened by an Arnold Rothstein hitman named Harry F. if he didn't promptly lose to the Cincinnati Reds in the first inning of the following game. It's an interesting story how this one became a myth in the first place. Yeah, so this is uh, another Elliot Asinoff myth, and it absolutely originated with him. You know, he actually invented this character, Harry F. He admitted this in a book that he wrote in 1979 called Bleeding Between the Lines about the process of Eight Men Out, researching it, writing it, and what he had hoped would become either a TV series or a movie, which had not happened at that time. He was writing about kind of the behind the scenes process. And uh, one of his revelations in that 1979 book was that he, on the advice of his lawyer, he invented this hitman character and called him Harry F to have him threaten Lefty Williams to throw game eight. And the reason he did that is because he said, if anyone else used this character, Harry F, he would know that they were stealing from his book, Eight Men Out, and that he could go sue them for copyright infringement. Well, that's not how copyright law works, but that was what he said. That's what he admitted. And, you know, he never denied that he did that. He also said there was a second character that he invented that he did not reveal the identity. And so we're still trying to figure out who that was. <laughs> I think it was one of the lowly gamblers again. But mm-hmm. but yeah, so he, he admitted it. You know, he said, this is what I did. And he based his hitman character on a story that was published in the New Yorker after Lefty Williams died in 1959. And there was a first person essay by a kid who grew up in Chicago. And he said that in the early 1930s, he was living in the same building with Lefty and Leary Williams. And he used to go over and have cookies and milk with Leary Williams and occasionally talk baseball with Lefty. And one day Leary, his Lefty's wife, told him the story of the Black Sox scandal, why he was no longer playing baseball. And Leary, according to this little boy at the time, Leary claimed that the reason Lefty did it was because he was threatened. 
and this kid prints this 25 years later in the New Yorker and Elliot Asanoff living in New York at the time had read it and clipped it out and uh, decided oh yeah that has to be a scene so he embellished the scene he invented the character you know he placed it before game eight which Lefty Williams famously blew up in the first inning and Mm -hmm. got taken out this is how the myth got started. And of course, you know, the movie got made in 1988, the Eight Men Out film. And, you know, this is a dramatic scene in the movie. And so the myth has just grown and grown. But it comes from, you know, this one flimsy reference written after Lefty died that no one can prove. Right. You know, and again, even if Lyria was, you know, telling an eight-year-old boy that this happened, that doesn't mean that all these other details that Asanoff clearly invented are true. So there's really no evidence for it whatsoever. Yeah. It's also funny that the general public has kind of co-opted that myth, and it's not just Lefty Williams who was threatened, it was every player. It's just funny to see how these myths have grown over the years from the little seedling of fake information to begin with. Myth number five is that the fixing of the 1919 World Series was baseball's single sin, an isolated incident of corruption that signaled a loss of innocence for fans. And we kind of touched on this earlier, but why is that something that so many people believe? Well, you know, we were talking a little bit about Fenway Park and the gamblers section in the grandstands and the culture of gambling and the things like that. And the reality is, you know, as long as there has been baseball, there has been betting on baseball. And that's something that as fans, having an investment in the game is something that, you know, makes sports fun to follow. And it might be an emotional investment. You're rooting for players on the team or rooting for the team on the field. But a financial investment is also a good investment, too, you know, and and a way to get invested in the game. And so, yeah. Yeah, you know, having a little money riding on it makes it more interesting. That's always, always been true in sports Um, and in a lot of other things, too, but especially in sports. And so that's been true, you know, ever since the game became more serious in the early 19th century, people have bet on it and bet on the results and bet on the next pitch and bet on, you know, bet on everything. And so, you know, that's true today in the 21st century with legal sports betting. And it was also true 100 years ago. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, this idea that the Black Sox scandal came out of nowhere and that nobody had any idea that players would take bribes to fix the World Series, you know, is just a load of hogwash because, like you mentioned earlier, almost every World Series before 1919 had rumors that players were being bribed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were games all over the place. Hal Chase had just had, you know, an actual hearing in 1918 to talk about his game fixing ring. He was bribing his own teammates. He was bribing opponents. He had been doing this for years. This was not unknown. You know, there was a story that I wrote for a magazine a few years ago about a riot at Fenway Park in 1917 right. where the gamblers in Fenway charged onto the field. It was raining at the time and the White Sox were actually the visiting team <laughs> and the White Sox were winning. They were beating Babe Ruth and the Red Sox and gamblers charge on the field trying to delay the game so that the rain would come harder and they would have to call it before they lost their bets and you know the White Sox actually got in fights with some of the gamblers and Fred McMullen and Buck Weaver got arrested briefly and so you know this was a big story it was reported there's a photo of this you know like so gamblers were on the field and it was and it's funny that it wasn't until two years later that the first game that was actually thrown in baseball history (laughs) right exactly yeah (laughs) none of it nobody had any idea that this was happening and you know and that's what baseball wants you to believe they want you to believe that these eight players that's it you know and once they got rid of them once they kicked them out of baseball that's it The, Mm -hmm. the problem is over you know and that's also what they want you to believe about steroids and peds is that as long as these individual players are gone, right. everything's fine. You know, and It was only Barry Bonds and yeah, Roger Clemens and yeah. everybody else was clean. This is the strategy that baseball uses to deal with its issues. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is the strategy they used in the Black Sox scandal too, is the eight guys are gone, it's over. You know, we don't want to talk about it anymore. Well, it was only Daryl Strawberry and Doc Gooden in the 80s who were doing drugs. It wasn't Tim Raines. Right. It wasn't anybody else. Yeah, no, they they pick winners and losers in these scandals. And the reality is the losers are always the players, according to the owners. And the winners are always the owners. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how it works. And that's how it works in every scandal. It's working with the Astros right now. You pick four people to blame, maybe five or six if you count, you know, the Jose Altuve's of the world, and blame them. Point Mm -hmm. the finger at them. That's what baseball wants you to believe is that that's the problem, not the institutional corruption and not the, you know, ways that everybody turned a blind eye and the fact that half a dozen other teams were stealing signs electronically too, just in different ways or, you know, not to the 
the level that the Astros took it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's also what they want you to believe about the Black Sox is that, yeah, yeah, maybe other things were happening, but the Black Sox were so much worse. And that part is probably true. But the idea that no other games were fixed, no other World Series were fixed, and the Black Sox were it, yeah. They want you to believe that. and Or the idea no that those were the last games that were fixed. You know, so many people think that as soon as the 1919 World Series was over, all eight of these guys were found out immediately and they were all kicked out of baseball the next day. They played almost the entire 1920 season. So, yeah, there's just so much to this story that people have wrong. Yeah, and, you know, that gets into the the cover-up, which we'll talk about soon. Pointing the finger at eight players and saying, well, this is it. This Mm -hmm. is the cause of the problem and we're going to kick them out and now that's the solution. It's just, you know, couldn't be further from the truth. People assume that because of the astronomical salaries that players are paid today, that another game-fixing scandal could never possibly happen again. But you're not so sure about that. How could something like this happen in the future? So, you know, I'm not as concerned about a Black Sox scandal repeating itself. I'm not sure that it's wise to bribe the players these days because, you know, salaries are much higher and it would take a lot more. You know, what are, what are you going to... What amount of money are you going to throw at Bryce Harper to throw the World Series? I mean, is that even possible? I mean, is there any number, regardless of his ethics, is there any number that he would even consider when he's making, you know, $30 million a season or whatever? Uh, No, uh, there's really not. I mean, that's just not really possible anymore. And, And even if you're just looking at players that are making the league minimum or whatever, we have had some players, minor league players and international players that have gotten into gambling debt or have found themselves in some dire straits in, in personal situations and have gotten caught up in some bribes. I mean, I believe there's a pitcher in the Dodgers organization that was banned from Korean baseball for game fixing over there. And so it's still possible, but it's very unlikely. What, what I believe is much more likely is what we call spot fixing. Um, they're not trying to influence the result of the game, win or loss. They're trying to influence prop bets on you know what's happening in the fourth inning. You know who scores? Mm-hmm. Does the visiting team or the home team score a run in the fourth inning? And influence that because you can make a lot of money on all those little little bets. And as we've seen around the world in you know soccer, cricket, tennis, golf, you know we've seen scandals in the last 10, 20 years in those sports, and sometimes very bad scandals with that type of fixing. Um, It's more akin to point shaving than it is to the Black Sox scandal. But those scandals are happening all over the place all the time. And the more opportunity there is in baseball to bet, the more opportunity there is to influence, you know, those things. Or in the NBA with Tim Donaghy. I mean, there is no telling how many umpires are susceptible. Yeah. And umpires are not making $30 million a year. Right. You know, and I think that's actually something that baseball has to take absolutely seriously is it's not the players that you'd necessarily have to worry about. It's everybody else who is not making 30 million. The official scorers, the groundskeepers, the video coordinators, the athletic trainers. Right. uh, You know, there are so many people that have an influence on what happens on the field that are not, athletes in uniform and those are people that do have a price and those are people who might find themselves with life-changing money to influence something and again it doesn't have to be a world series mm-hmm. it can be a game in the middle of may mm-hmm. and they can make a life-changing money that way and that's something that again i do believe that baseball has a lot of very sophisticated ways to track this stuff now but that doesn't mean it won't happen it's happened in every sport around the world and it's continuing to happen and the more baseball makes it easier and encouraging people to bet the more you will find someone that doesn't know the line or doesn't care about the line and crosses the line and i think that's something you know again we saw it with the houston astros with the electronics and sign stealing is there was a line but it was clearly a very fuzzy one and they weren't going to enforce it and then they found a few people that decided yeah if the line's not going to get enforced we're going to cross it because nobody's going to do anything about it and the other thing is the Houston Astros were worth $280 million more the year after they won the World Series than the year before. So a $5 million fine is nothing. Yeah. I would do it every year. <laughs> yeah. You're going to take away some draft picks and find me $5 million? Yeah. Go ahead. And it is not hard to find people who are going to cross that line and cross it repeatedly. You know, If the consequences do not match the actions, you know, 
the punishment is not harsh enough. You know, it, it's not enough to outweigh the rewards. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's human nature. You're always going to find somebody that's going to go over. And, and part of the league's responsibility, Major League Baseball's responsibility, is to find that line and to say, hey, here's where we draw the line. Because it can be arbitrary. But here's where we draw the line. Here's what we're going to enforce. And if you do cross it, there will be consequences. Mm-hmm. You know, we're living in a time when people are getting away with all kinds of things because there are no consequences for it. And that is also true with baseball and with, you know, these types of integrity scandals. If there's no consequences, people are going to cross that line and going to cross it in ways that can be very, very bad. Mm -hmm. Myth number six is that league and team officials heard rumors about the 1919 World Series fix, but no concrete evidence surfaced until the grand jury investigation in the fall of 1920. How did that become a myth that people believed in the first place when there was so much evidence that so many people knew about it while it was happening? Well, this gets back to what we were talking about with Charles Comiskey and the detective investigation is he already knew what was happening. There were gamblers approaching him before game one in Cincinnati, and there were gamblers approaching other team owners and Van Johnson and other people. And so, you know, they knew. And, you know, they can claim a little plausible deniability that, oh, we weren't sure, we didn't have proof, or libel laws were different. But they knew. They all knew. You know, they had enough knowledge to confront the team, which supposedly Kid Gleason, the White Sox manager, confronted his team at least once, possibly multiple times during the World Series. You know, hey, don't do this, <laughs> including possibly threatening to shoot them. Um, and so, you know, like they knew. Everybody and Ray Schalk knew. was, yeah, you know, Ray Schalk was possibly punching out his own pitchers after games. Um, again, there's at least one documented story. It might it might have happened twice. So, yeah, they all knew. And it was more a matter of waiting to see who would do anything about it. And baseball's leadership was in shambles at the time. The three-man national commission was crumbling. That's why Judge Landis was hired the next year as commissioner. And so there was a, a vacuum of leadership, and nobody did anything about it. Comiskey didn't do anything about it. He blamed Van Johnson. Van Johnson blamed Charles Comiskey about it. And, you know, Gary Herman, the Reds owner, is laughing all the way to the bank, and his team's winning the World Series. So. Yeah. Nobody did anything about it. And I think this idea that, well, we didn't have enough proof or we didn't have concrete knowledge or whatever, they did. They just, they were doing what they always did, which is sweep it under the rug Mm -hmm. until it became too late. They ended the 1919 season and didn't do anything about it. They let the 1920 season begin, didn't do anything about it. They almost got through the entire season, but there were too many rumors, not only about the 1919 White Sox, but about the 1920 White Sox as well. Mm -hmm. They were throwing games left and right. We have documentation of possibly up to 12 games that they threw, and they lost the pennant by two to Cleveland. From 1916 to 1920, the White Sox never lost more than four games in a row. Until they had a, I think, a five-game lead in September. In September, yep. And mysteriously lost seven straight games. Yeah. I think three of those were to Boston, one of the worst teams in the league. So yeah. there's documented evidence that they threw a lot of games in 1920. So yeah. this was happening over and over again. They could have done something about this years ago, and they never did. And this is what it led to. It culminated in the Black Sox scandal. It did not start with the Black Sox scandal. Right. This was years and years of corruption that was allowed to let slide. Hal Chase was allowed to get away with it. The White Sox were allowed to get away with it. Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker fixed the game. They were allowed to get away with it. And baseball just didn't do anything about it. There were never any consequences for fixing games and taking bribe money. And so it went to the level it did because, you know, the Black Sox players decided, yeah, we're not going to waste our limited time on the field. We're going to take advantage and make some money. And they did take it too far and Mm -hmm. they did fix the World Series. And we know that for a fact because they admitted it. So there's still other rumors that we don't know about. There's still other players that there's a lot of cloud of suspicion that we don't always know about. We do know about the Black Sox. And so that is the one major difference is that they did get caught and something did happen to them. Let's talk about the Reds real quick, though, because a lot of people assume that they only won the World Series because the White Sox threw it and that they were not a deserving champion. They weren't a good team. That's not the case. I mean, they won the National League, so they they must have been somewhat okay. But they also had some really great pitching depth. They had a few good offensive players as well. I mean, so how good were the Reds? And if that series had been played on the level, would it have been a compelling series? 
Oh, I think everybody in Cincinnati has good reason to celebrate that team. That was a fantastic team. Their level of success didn't last very long. You know, people started getting hurt. And so it was, it was really kind of a one-year run. But, I mean, they were a fantastic team that year. And, and they have every reason to celebrate a deserving World Series championship. Because the reality is, even if that series had been played on the level, the best of nine format that they went to in 1919 really hurt the White Sox. White Sox had only two good starting pitchers. And and they who were healthy. They were, who were healthy. And they were going to rely on those two starting pitchers for nine games if they could. Uh, you know, the emergence of the rookie, Dickie Kerr, was a surprise. That was mm-hmm. not something they were counting on. They were counting on Seacott and Williams to go possibly seven or eight or possibly even nine games in that series. And, you know, that, that would have been a tough ask for everybody. The Reds, meanwhile, started five different starting pitchers, mm-hmm. five-man rotation in 1919. Nobody had that. Right. And they did. And they had a good one and a deep one. And so... They had a better overall pitching staff. They had a solid lineup, you know, not a ton of 300 hitters, but, you know, a solid lineup up and down, no real weaknesses, good defense, good teamwork, great manager, Pat Moran. You know, he had led the Phillies to their first pennant in 1915. He had come over to Cincinnati, led them to their first pennant in 30 years. Yeah, I mean, it was a very good, deep team. And, you know, obviously they had a little bit more cohesion than the White Sox did as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think there's every reason to believe that they could have beaten the White Sox. And really the biggest reason the White Sox were favored is because they had already won in 1917. They had just about everybody back with the exception of the injured Red Faber, future Hall of Fame pitcher, which is a huge loss for them. Mm -hmm. And also the American League was very dominant. I mean, the only World Series the National League had won in that decade was the Miracle Braves in 1917. 14, right. you know, so the American League was winning the World Series every year, and they were expected to win this World Series. But the Reds were very good, and they absolutely could have won, especially in that best of nine format. The seventh myth is that at the Black Sox trial, the courtroom was shocked when prosecutors announced that the grand jury testimonies from Eddie Seacott, Shoeless Joe Jackson, and Lefty Williams had been stolen. How did this become a myth people believed in the first place? Yeah, so this was, you know, uh, another part of the trial that was reported accurately at the time. And then Elliot Asinoff kind of embellished it. It did happen. There was a theft of records in the state's attorney's office in Cook County, and that was related to a contentious election in the fall of 1920. New administration came in. There was kind of a Republican wave all around the country, and a new administration, new state's attorney came in, and so in the course of leaving paperwork for the new state's attorney, one of the clerks, whether he did it intentionally or not is a little bit unknown, but definitely took some records and took some of the transcripts, and so those were missing. And so when the new state's attorney came in and started trying to compile their case against the Black Sox, they realized, oh yeah, some of the stuff's missing, and and they didn't discover this until the trial had already started, and so... What they ended up doing was rereading the transcripts back from the stenographer's notes. And so in the same way that they were created in the first place, they just created a new transcript and they had to do it kind of on the fly and they had to do it in the courtroom. And in the middle of the trial, they kind of stopped the trial for an evidentiary hearing to see if these transcripts could be allowed. They were allowed, but then they were allowed in a limited way in which none of the players who did not testify, which is five of the eight Black Sox, their names were not allowed to be reread into the record. And so what happened was you had the stenographers reading the transcripts back, but they were saying Mr. Blank, Mr. Blank, Mr. Blank, and Mr. Blank met in this hotel room. Mm-hmm. And so it was a very boring procedure, very tedious. The courtroom was very hot, you know, over 90 degrees in the middle of July when this was happening. And so it was a very tedious process to read these records back. But I mean, they, they read them back. They were part of the trial. The jury did hear them. So they were admitted as evidence. And so it was really no real problem. The theft was a minor, minor problem part of the trial proceedings, Mm -hmm. but it was embellished by Elliot Asinoff and it was turned into this huge scandal. It's turned into, you know, one of the main reasons why the Black Sox were acquitted is because there was this conspiracy to steal the records. No, it was some lowly clerk in the state's attorney's (laughs) office and the transcripts were read back into the record at the trial. It was, it was really no thing. It's turned into a big thing. Mm -hmm. The eighth and final myth you guys included in this project is that the White Sox and Reds players were extremely reluctant to talk about the 1919 World Series after the fact. In his book, Eight Men Out, Elliot Asnoff wrote, It was a solid front of silence, of shame and sorrow, and futility and fear. 
Is that something he made up for his book or was that the prevailing thought in 1963 when he wrote it? Well, he didn't make it up for his book because he really did believe that because his experience in the late 50s and early 1960s was that when he attempted to interview the surviving Black Sox players and surviving Clean Sox and Cincinnati Reds, they almost to a man refused to talk to him. Four of the Black Sox were no longer living at the time because Lefty Williams had just died too. And so he tried to contact the other four. So that was Seacott, Gandalf, Risberg turned him down, and Happy Felsch was the only one that allowed him to come in. And why do you think that was? Because they had spoken with other people and other reporters and had given other interviews in the years in between. So why was it specifically him that they were like, did they just not trust him? Did they think he was trying to profit off their name and their story? What was the story there? I do think there was a little element of, of that kind of skepticism that he's trying to make a lot of money off our names. That is something you see a lot with old ball players. Mm-hmm. Um, they believe that you're getting rich off their stories or off their names, and the reality is authors don't usually make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but it's hard to convince them of that, and that's something that I do think Asnoff and other authors of the time, like Lawrence Ritter, who did Glory of Their Times in that era, interviewing ball players. You know, he also encountered that too, as you know, some skepticism of what are you really in this for? And I think I don't want to get into players' heads to say, you know, here's what they actually thought of Asnoff because we don't know for sure. Could have been anything. Could have been bedside manner of his interview techniques. It could have been they just woke up on the wrong side of the bed that day mm-hmm. and, and decided, ah, we're not talking anymore. We're just going to be grumpy about it. Chick Gandel and Swede Risberg were notoriously grumpy in most circumstances. You know, Seacott was generally friendlier, and he certainly talked to many, many other reporters, but he decided he didn't want to be involved with this, and that's his prerogative. Only Happy Felsch talked to him, and, you know, Felsch didn't really know that much. He really didn't know much about the scandal and about the story. He knew what he had heard over the years, which, of course, he got half the details wrong in, in his interviews with Asanoff, but they just didn't want to talk to him. Ray Schalk famously threw him out of his office at Purdue University where he was coaching at the time. I just think that whatever it was, they decided they just didn't want to talk to him, but I think it was all individual cases. I don't think there was a conspiracy not to talk to Elliot Asanoff. Right, right, I think right. they just, some writers are better at it than others, have better luck. And so I don't want to cast any blame on Asanoff for not being able to talk. What I do blame him for is thinking that his own experience was universal because it really was not. Other Mm -hmm. writers did have good relationships with these players and did talk to them. You know, there was a sports writer that Shoeless Joe Jackson in Greenville had known for decades and they would go to ball games together you know local league games together and just sit there and, and the guy would write about jackson's observations and jackson was interviewed about the black Sox scandal shirley povich of the washington mm-hmm. post went down and met up with jackson and i mean it, lots of writers did it's just elliot asinoff was not one of them and instead of oh yeah these guys just refused to talk elliot asinoff embellished he filled in the gaps mm-hmm. where he did not have enough information He filled in that gap, and the way he filled in this gap was, well, they're ashamed of the story, they're embarrassed, they're still threatened by gamblers, they're still scared, and they don't want to talk about it. And he came up with this theory that this was the reason, and the reality is they probably just said no, and Mm -hmm. that was it. Because the reality is we now have, thanks to the digitization of newspapers, we now have over 140 interviews of people who participated in the 1919 World Series. So White Sox, Black Sox, and Cincinnati Reds. We now have over 140 documented interviews of all those players over over the decades. Some of them, like Ed Roush, he lived until 1988. He talked over and over again. He told the same story over and over Mm -hmm. again. But it was a good story. But, I mean, yeah, we've got a dozen or two interviews of Shoeless Joe Jackson over the years, most of them in the Greenville News. Yeah, he talked a lot. With, Handel, with Scoop Latimer is the— yeah, There you yeah. go. So, yeah, you know, and this is a guy that, you know, he had known in the minor leagues. Uh, you know, Scoop was already a sports writer in the early 20th century. And so these and then guys, there was obviously that Sport Magazine article with Furman Bisher. Very famous article from 1949, 30th anniversary of the Black Sox scandal. So, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, every every time, you know, there was a scandal, somebody would call up these players. You know, Eddie Seacott's nephew, Al Seacott, you know, ended up getting called up to the New York Yankees in the 1950s. And so people would call Eddie up and ask him about Al and then ask him about his own career and occasionally ask him about the Black Sox. And Mm so... They would talk. They definitely talk. They just didn't talk to this one writer. And instead of him saying, well, you know, they just didn't talk to me, he kind of embellished that and was like, well, they won't talk to anybody. And the reality is, no, they did talk. They just didn't talk to you. How did he know to reach out to Abe Attell? 
Was um, his name such common knowledge that he was easily tracked down like that? No, but what happened was CBS TV network had contracted Elliot Asinoff to uh, help with the screenplay for a planned TV special, like a one hour, you know, it wasn't a documentary by any means, but it was just kind of a, almost a reenactment of the Black Sox trial in 1959. And so they had contracted or the production company had contracted with Elliot Asinoff to help with the research. And that's how he got started. He was writing a TV show. Oh. Oh. about the Black Sox scandal. And so as part of that, there was a kind of a gossip magazine called Cavalier Magazine. And so Elliot Asnoff ended up tagging along with two other writers to an interview with Abe Attell, and they were going to talk about Abe Attell's boxing career a little bit, but also some of the other stuff that he was known for. And he ended up talking a lot more about the Black Sox scandal. And so they turned it into kind of this tell-all expose. Abe Attell tells his story. And it was in Cavalier Magazine in 1959, and Elliot Asinoff was part of that. We actually have a full transcript of that interview. It was, you know, in some skyscraper in New York City in 1959, and Attell showed up. I think a law firm's office told his story for a couple of hours and that was it. And Attell and Asinoff continued to talk a little bit more as Asinoff was working on the book. The TV show, there was an airing once, um, but it didn't turn out to be what they had planned for and was kind of a flop. And it, Asinoff turned his research into a book instead. Hmm. And so he did talk to, you know, Abe Attell a few more times. He did talk to Happy Felsch and, and a few others and, you know, did his own research. But they, that's how they got Abe Attell was... It was for this TV show, and then it was for this magazine article, and that was really the bulk of Attell's version of the story ended up in Eight Men Out. Interesting. Okay, so those were the top eight myths that actually made it into the presentation of this project. Were there one or two others that got left on the cutting room floor? Well, the biggest myth I think that people know about is the Say It Ain't So Joe myth. Mm -hmm. And that story, obviously, is probably the most famous story about Shoeless Joe. The little boy approached him outside the courthouse and wanted to know if the scandal was true or not. And we have film footage of Shoeless Joe Jackson exiting the courthouse uh, after that day. And there's a huge crowd of people beside him and behind him whooping and hollering and it's a madhouse scene um and he's kind of accompanied by two bailiffs essentially and trying to protect him from the crowd and it, maybe it happened after the cameras turned off or, or something but there's really no evidence uh, whatsoever that he was stopped by one kid saying say it ain't so joe not only is there no evidence joe said multiple times later in life that yeah, that never happened never happened yeah. yeah, no. And it's funny, too, because the story did get printed in the day or two after the, his grand jury testimony. There were some versions of it, mm -hmm. but there's also versions of Lefty Williams getting approached in the exact same manner. Like the Say It Ain't So story was told about Lefty Williams like mm. on September 30th of, of 1920. <laughs> so, so the story was out there, but also completely made up. There's just no evidence. Are there any myths that you'd still like to debunk about the Black Sox scandal, but you just don't have the concrete proof to publicly do it yet? Well, you know, I think that one of the biggest myths about this story, and maybe not even a myth, but just kind of a, you know, we're still trying to figure it out, is the money trail. I think that is something that would be extremely helpful to know more about, you know, the players, how much they got paid, who they were paid by, when the payoffs were made. You know, one of the reasons we know more now about the group of Iowa gamblers is because we were able to track down some stories about a meeting between the gamblers after game three, when the White Sox surprisingly won behind the rookie Dickie Kerr, the gamblers met to try to raise a pool of money to pay off the players to get the fix to keep going. And so that's a big part of how we've learned more about that group of gamblers. Hmm. But we don't know much after that about when were those payoffs made. And, you know, we know Joe Jackson's testimony is that, you know, it was after game four or possibly game five that Lefty Williams approached him with an envelope of $5,000. You know, was that from the Iowa gamblers? Was that part of Nat Evans or Ava Tell's money or Sports Sullivan's money? We don't know that for sure because a lot of those guys went to the grave not telling their story at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're almost lucky to have Ava Tell's version because at least we have that. We don't have Sports Sullivan's version at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bruce Allardyce has done a ton of research on Sports Sullivan and his life. And Bruce believes, and I agree, that Sports Sullivan is like the big missing link to all of this because he did know Arnold Rothstein and he did have a ton of connections. Who were his partners? 
Rogers? Who did he involve with this? We know his connections with Nat Evans and Ava Tell and that sort of thing. And we kind of know, you know, with the Bill Burns and Billy Maharg side of things, we know vaguely how Sport Sullivan was involved. But he must have had other people under him, or he must have been making bets with other people. Mm -hmm. We don't have his version of any of this. He did not testify in any way publicly. He did not give interviews. You know, he was basically forgotten for the last 25 years of his life. Did he have kids? No, uh, Mm -hmm. he did not. So we have no version of Sport Sullivan's story. And frankly, he knew more than Abe Attell did. We do have Bill Burns, Sleepy Bill Burns. We've got Billy Maharg's version. We got Abe Attell's self embellished versions. But we don't have Sport Sullivan at all. And so that's something that, you know, maybe there is an interview somewhere uh, with Sport Sullivan that will turn up in some obscure Massachusetts newspaper from 1934 or something. Somewhere that no one's looking for it right now because we don't know it exists. Maybe it will turn up one day. And that would be awesome because those are the versions of the story that we don't have. You know, maybe there are interviews of the Black Sox players that we haven't found yet because no one knows to look for them. I've seen interviews, you know, again, with players in their hometowns. Those are a little bit easier to look for. But there's also interviews in random papers that only appeared once in that paper. And if you don't know that it exists, you will never know because how are you supposed to know that somebody called them up in 1954? Right. So those are still being found. And those are, you know, things that help piece together the story. And, you know, the more versions that we get, the easier it is to piece it all together and say, okay, my colleague Bill Lamb has written a great article a couple of years ago in the Sabre Research Journal about different versions of Shoeless Joe's story, mm-hmm. you know, that he told, whether it was in interviews, whether it was on the stand in courthouses across the country, whether it was at his house, he told a very different version of the story. And so Bill has collected all these different versions, both the testimony, courtroom testimony, and also the interviews. Said, so, well, you know, here's how he was telling the story in 1920 and 21. And here's how he was telling a story in 1949 and 1951, right before he died. And it's very different. And Eddie Collins is the same way. You know, Rick Hewn of Sabre mm-hmm. has pieced together Eddie Collins's interviews. And he was, you know, the general manager of the Red Sox for years. So he was very prominent in baseball for decades. And he told very different versions of how the Black Sox scandal happened right after the fact. And then also decades later when he was trying to tell a little bit more of a self-serving story. So his version of the story changed. Ray Schalk's version of the story changed. So being able to piece those together and take a 30,000 foot view of, oh, okay, you know, because you do have to be a little bit more skeptical of what some of these guys were saying in their old age when you didn't have the baseball encyclopedia, you didn't have baseball reference, you couldn't go back and confirm the details of their stories. This is where, you know, memory and oral history kind of plays tricks on you. But if you've got a dozen interviews of Shoeless Joe Jackson, it's easier to see patterns of here's the story he was telling. And the fact is, Shoeless Joe in 1920 and 21 was telling a very different story about, oh yeah, I definitely did it. I definitely took the money and I wish I had more money. You know, they promised me 20,000 and they only paid me five. He told that story a lot in 1920 and 21 and 23. By the end of his life, that's not the story he was telling. He Mm -hmm. was telling the story about my name was included, but I had nothing to do with this. And in some cases he even said I never took a dime. And we know that's not true. Like we know that's a lie. So if that's the only interview you have or the only version of his story you have, it's like, well, maybe that's the truth. And then you realize, oh, no, no, he was telling a very different story 25 years earlier. And that's true for a lot of them, too. That's true for Joe, even when he tells the story of how he got his nickname. Some days it was a home game. Some days it was on the road. Some days it was a triple. Sometimes it was a home run. You know, so like, I think he would tell the story that his audience wanted to hear. Yeah. And, you know, memory plays tricks. I mean, this is something we all have to deal with as human beings is that the details get fuzzy. And Mm -hmm. as more time passes, the details, you know, change. And that's okay. You know, the fish gets bigger uh, is the phrase that we use in Georgia. So you understand that to an effect. But the reality is... You have to be able to look at the big picture and you have to be able to look at the patterns to see this is closer to the truth than not and vice versa. And I think that's part of the challenge of researching a story like this is because there's so many different details and so many different angles. You have to be able to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together and sometimes they don't always match. And the reality is, oh, yeah, you got to go find this other piece to connect it because it won't connect otherwise. So you also play vintage baseball, which anyone who's followed you on Twitter long enough probably already knows. Uh, and what, by the way, what's your Twitter handle? Buck Weaver. At Buck hmm. Weaver. <laughs> I've had that handle for a long, <laughs> long time in a lot of different formats. When you first started playing vintage baseball, what was the hardest vintage rule to get used to? 
So I was playing 1860 uh, rule book in Arizona mm -hmm. when I first started playing vintage ball. And the hardest rule for me was getting used to the one bounce out. Uh, you can catch a fly ball on a bounce. Mm -hmm. And runners can advance at their own risk. And so the base running was actually the hardest part of that yeah. because if you grow up playing modern baseball rules, you see a fly ball that's going to drop, you think, oh, I can, you know, I have to go sometimes or I can go and advance to the next base. And in vintage ball, you see a ball that's going to drop. Well, the batter still might be out, so you don't have to go and you can choose whether or not to try to advance. And so it's a strategic move to say, oh, the ball's going to drop. I can go. Whereas in modern baseball, it's a little bit different. And so that, for me, that was the biggest rule change to try to get used to. And I tell everyone that plays that style of vintage baseball, you will get thrown out on the bases <laughs> because you forget the rule because it is absolutely against your every instinct to do that. And yet it's allowed back then. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's still a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's so much fun to get out there and wear the you know old uniforms and play ball in that style. It gives you it gives you a greater appreciation for how the game's changed. Tell me a little bit about Warren Ballpark in Bisbee, Arizona. Not just what it means to you personally, but its significance historically. I mean, that is one of my favorite places in the world, Bisbee, Arizona, and specifically Warren Ballpark. And it's one of the very few adobe brick ballparks ever built that was used uh, in professional baseball. But it was originally built in 1909, and the wooden grandstand was replaced in the 30s. So there's a kind of a disputed claim on whether it's actually a 110-year-old ballpark or not. But uh, they've been playing baseball on that site continuously for definitely over a century. And the Black Sox played there. You know, Honus Wagner played there. Connie Mack brought the Philadelphia A's there. The big 1913 World Tour that John McGraw and Charlie Comiskey organized, they came down to Bisbee on the train and played there uh, on their way out to California. It's got a great, great history. It really feels like you're stepping back in time. And to be able to step in that ballpark, which they still use as the home field for Bisbee High School. So it's still in modern use. And obviously we play vintage baseball down there. It's just, oh, it's so much fun. And it's cool to step on the same diamond in the same area that Buck Weaver did in 1927 or whatever. It's incredible to have that type of living history because, as you mentioned earlier, you know, Fenway Park is the only American League stadium still around from that era, you know, Wrigley Field too. You can't go to these places anymore. They don't exist. And so right. to be able to go to a place like Warren Ballpark in Bisbee, which is down near the Mexican border, it's miles from nowhere, to be able to step on a field that Chick Gandel and Lefty Williams and Buck Weaver played on and Hal Chase – you can't find that anywhere and that's in and to think how did they get there <laughs> it's in the middle of nowhere it is 5000 miles from where they lived how did they physically get there <laughs> It, How was that coordinated? It is far away from everywhere. It's an hour and a half south of Tucson. It's three and a half hours from Phoenix. It's not close, but it happened, you know, as a copper mining town. And so it was on the train line. And, you know, they were able to take the train out from El Paso, basically. And they had cars then, too. But, yeah, it was on a train line. And so instead of going up through kind of eastern New Mexico and eastern Arizona, you know, they would take it all the way down to the border and you know it's a border town and and it was a place in the middle of nowhere but you know chick gandal had played down in mexico when he was a teenager mm. and hal chase had played down there and and was playing down in arizona before and he was the one that recruited the black Sox players in the 1920s to come out and play this outlaw league it was a four-team league el paso bisbee and douglas two copper mining towns in southern arizona and you've got fort bayard kind of a military hospital in silver city new mexico and war is uh, across the border from El Paso and Mexico. So, yeah, you've got this little outlaw league playing in these town that's on the railroads. And, uh, you know, they went down there for three summers in 1925, 26, 27 to play ball. And it's incredible to be down there in, you know, kind of the middle of nowhere and to see all these major league players come down. And it wasn't just the Black Sox. I mean, you know, Hal Chase was manager of a team. Jimmy O'Connell, former New York Giants outfielder, was part of this team. You know, they had a, a couple other guys that ended up playing in the major leagues afterwards. Sid Cohen, uh, the Cohen brothers uh, played in the New with the New York Giants later on. So, yeah, I mean, it was very talented league, and they ended up very far from Chicago, very far from their homes. But they had jobs, and they were playing ball, and they ended up in Bisbee. So yeah. it's cool to be able to go back down there and kind of reenact that a little bit. This is a question I like to ask lots of people. It's the time machine question. You can go back to any place and any time in history to be in the stands to watch one single baseball game. It doesn't need to be Major League. It could be any baseball game that you know happened. 
what game do you want to go back to see and where do you want to be sitting for it? Well, you know, if we're going to exclude the 1919 World Series, because game one of the 1919 World Series is really my number one answer. I want to not only see what happened on the field, and we do have film footage now, so we can actually see a few plays, but I want to check out the crowd. I want to see who's in the stands. Um, So that's my all-time number one answer. But if we exclude Black Sox games, I think my other answer would be the uh, Smokey Joe Wood and Walter Johnson duel in September 6th of 1912. Walter Johnson had already won 16 consecutive games to set a record earlier that season, and Smokey Joe Wood had won 13, and he was challenging Walter Johnson, so they switched the pitching rotations around so that the two would face each other at Fenway Park. And uh, Smokey Joe Wood and the Red Sox ended up winning the game, one to nothing. Great pitching duel, and they had an overflow crowd. There's a famous picture of them warming up, and Smokey Joe Wood is just surrounded by people next to the, you know, what they it wasn't even a bullpen, but, you know, where he was warming up to mm-hmm. pitch. Um, it's just an incredible atmosphere in the first year of Fenway Park. So I think that's my number one answer that's not a Black Sox game. <laughs> but my other answer would be kind of just a ballpark, and the Polo Grounds is the one for me that just stands out as, like, this unique ballpark. And I would love to have had the chance at any era. I would love to go see a Jackie Robinson Dodgers versus Giants game, Mm -hmm. any era of baseball, but seeing the polo grounds would have been my number one that I wish, you know, and I've talked to many people, including some older Sabre members that grew up going to Mets games or Giants games in the fifties and sixties. And um, that's the stadium that I feel like I missed. That's the stadium that I have in my head of like, Oh, this is old time baseball. Yeah. This is the one I would want to see is a game at the Polo Grounds. What are you currently working on or looking forward to? Right now, I am uh, working with the uh, Illinois Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission, and they are putting on a reproduction of the Black Sox trial. And they're uh, working on a couple different events, one in Springfield, Illinois, at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, and another one in Chicago at the Spurtis Institute. And uh, it's basically working with the uh, DePaul University Theater Department to put on a reproduction. And it's a really good reproduction. It's well done. It's very entertaining. I almost see it in the style of like the Music Man and just kind of a period piece reenactments of the Black Sox players and not only the baseball side of things and then especially the legal side of things because this is kind of a courthouse proceeding. It really focuses heavily on the grand jury and the criminal trial especially in a little bit of the civil court cases that Sheila's show had it as well. And so they're working closely with the Sabre Black Sox committee to make sure that they tell this story accurately and also in an interesting way. And I think they've done a fantastic job with it. DePaul University has been great to work with and the Supreme Court Preservation Commission has been fantastic in putting together a really cool program. And so we're doing these two events, one in Springfield, one in Chicago, and then we're having a panel discussion afterwards to talk more about the Black Sox and why this story is still relevant hundred years later. So it's a really fun event to be a part of. And, uh, you know, this is something that we were trying to do before pandemic and got pushed back a few years. A lot of fun to be involved and to help out with this. Cool. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you'd like people to know about? You know, I think the only thing is it's always great to hear from people who are just learning about the Black Sox scandal because for me that is very refreshing because I still have very good memories of my first years getting into this story and how excited and how much there was to learn about. But now that I've been doing this for a while and obviously my perspective's changed a little bit, but it's always fascinating to hear from people that are just rediscovering the story because, you know, some of them did not grow up with Eight Men Out being the prevailing story of of how this all happened. Some of them are, you know, starting to grow up with eight myths out and with our scandal on the South Side book and some other books that have been published the last couple of years. And so it's great to hear from people that are just discovering the story because a lot of times that fresh perspective brings some new questions and fresh questions. And it's like, hey, what else can we find out? Because I still have my questions that I want to learn about <laughs> that we, you know, touched on a little bit. Yeah. But other people do too. And that's something that continues to excite me about this story is that there's still more to learn and there's still more out there. And, you know, somebody can dig stuff up in Texas or Pennsylvania or Oregon or somewhere, you know, and find out something different about not only the eight men out, but also the gamblers and, you know, all the other people involved and the clean socks. And, you know, we're still learning more about these guys. We're still learning more. And then, you know, obviously, as I mentioned with legalized sports betting now, 
this is still relevant and this is still something that people are talking about and it helps to learn that history so that you know if and when we do have another gambling scandal in baseball and it is not if it is definitely when yeah it's going to be important to understand that history and understand hey baseball spent a hundred years telling people do not bet on baseball do not get involved in any way you know willie mays and mickey mantle were punished for associating with an atlantic city casino that they weren't even betting they were just greeters right you know they were punished for even associating with the casino banned not watch. just punished yeah, they, banned. Were, they were technically banned for life <laughs> And, you know, it lasted two years, but they were banned for life. And, you know, and today you cannot watch a single TV broadcast of a baseball game without being just inundated with gambling ads, you know, encouraging you to download an app somewhere and bet on the fourth inning. Or even the graphic on top of the player when he's at bat, it doesn't necessarily say batting average home run RBI anymore. It is the over under on what are the odds he's going to hit a home run this at bat. Yeah, that's insane yeah and it has changed so quickly and it's you know just something that again if you grew up in the days when you know there were signs on the outfield walls saying no betting on baseball and to see how quickly it's changed and how we can't escape it even if you want to or don't want to you cannot escape it betting is part of the baseball landscape today you cannot be a fan and escape betting because it's all over the place and that's something that Five years ago wasn't true, and 100 years ago definitely wasn't true. And so to understand how we got here, (laughs) you definitely have to understand what happened 100 years ago because that's a part of this story, and that's, you know, going to continue to be part of this story. How can people get more information about Sabre or find them online to follow? Sabre.org, S-A-B-R.org is absolutely the best place. We've got over 60,000 articles on baseball history of all kinds. Browse the website. And and that's not an exaggeration. You literally have over 60,000 articles. We, we do, yeah. yeah. Going back over 50 years, Sabre was founded in 1971, and we've got a lot of the archives online now. And so, yeah, you can literally find over 60,000 articles on baseball history. It's incredible. It's great. I mean, there's so much information out there. And, you know, of course, there's so many people in Sabre that are willing to help, willing to take some time to answer questions and point you in the right direction if you're interested interested in anything under the sun related to baseball, not only history, but the modern game today. I mean, if you're interested in anything, you will find a Sabre member that shares that interest. And that's something that you can't find everywhere else. I mean, social media has helped bring people together in a lot of different ways. But Sabre is a really special community for passionate baseball fans. And that's something that it's hard to find. And, you know, when you find all the good people that are involved in this organization, I mean, I wouldn't still be a member and still be working for Sabre if I did not wholeheartedly believe that this is just a really great community of people. And what about you personally? How can people follow you on social media or reach out to you and keep up with what you're working on? I'm on Twitter, uh, at Buck Weaver, but obviously people can email me through the Sabre website or get in touch with me. DMs are open, you know, so if you ever have any questions, my own personal website, jacobpomerickey.com, has a lot of my articles, Black Sox and otherwise, that I've written. I'm always trying to write more or getting interviewed or whatever about different aspects of baseball history. So I am always happy to talk baseball, always happy to answer questions. I hear from students, I hear from reporters all the time that, you know, again, even if I don't have the answers, and I don't have many of them, I have a few on certain subjects but if i don't have the answers i can definitely help point you uh, in the right direction to, to find out someone who does yes uh you've always been so kind and generous with your time to me even before i had any association with the museum so thank you and thanks for your time today and just being who you are you awesome Awesome. Well, thanks uh, for having me. Always fun talking baseball with you and hanging out. And wherever we end up next, uh, I'm sure we'll continue to talk more baseball. Deal. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Dan. Let's see if you remember how to do this. (laughs) All right. Now it's time for a segment called What'd You Think, Mom? Where we talk to my mom who just listened to the interview with me and we ask her what she thinks. This is my real, actual mom. Her (laughs) name is Lori, but I've always just called her mom. Can you say something to prove that you are my mom? Still am your mom. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So no, you cannot say something (laughs) specific about me or... (laughs) Oh, oh, let's see. Um... We're going to have to replace you for season four. (laughs) I'm so out of practice, not yeah. not from being your mom, but um, <laughs> let's see. Nah, I got nothing. Okay, great. What did, you, <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the Jacob Pomeranke interview? He's the best, isn't he? 
Oh, man. Kindred spirit, yeah. first of all. This interview is my jam on so many different levels. And when I started listening to it, I'm thinking of him as the Black Sox expert, not even thinking of the other big hat he wears, which is his role with Sabre. Mm -hmm. And I loved that you deep dove into Sabre because I've been a Sabre member for three years. Yeah. And some of the points that came up of a lot of people might hear of Sabre if they're interested in baseball. But then they see what the acronym means, and they think that's not for them. And I have to say I was one of those people. I was one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It gives you a different idea of what it really is until you realize what it is when you become a member. And I have loved being a member. And one of the things that I am especially excited about is the Baseball Graves project that they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a cemetery person, I always have been, because I'm a historian, and cemeteries are history. And whether you are just general history or a niche where you're going to look at graves of a particular interest of yours, they are history. And what Sabre has done is they put an interactive map on their website that you can download. I believe it was the Sabre Landmarks Committee that Yes, that was this. the committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a map of the U.S. with pinpoints throughout the country of every cemetery that they are aware of that has a baseball player within its confines. Well, that's one way to use the map, but the map itself has any baseball-related landmark, whether it's a statue somewhere or a plaque somewhere. or Right, but the Graves one is a little bit more specific, I mm -hmm, think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so recently I was going to Chicago, and the day that email came through with the link... I was all over it. I probably spent, I don't know, three or four hours because as a researcher, what happens, exactly what Jacob was describing. You're looking for one thing, you find something else, and then that's the life of a researcher. Now you're down a rabbit hole that mm -hmm. you're hoping you can get out of. Well, when Jacob and I were in Chicago in, I think, August of 22 or something, we went to the gravesite of Charles Comiskey. He had never been to that site. So we, we went, he right. and I. And right. It's real nerd stuff. But hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh oh, There. You want to know how I'm your mom? There you go. <laughs> right. So I knew that I was going to be visiting a cemetery on this Chicago trip to visit a friend. That is a cemetery I go to almost every single time I'm in Chicago. Found out, oh yeah, Harry Carey is the next section over. And the next section over from Harry is Gabby Hartnett who has meaning for me as a Chicagoan who bowled in his bowling alley mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1980s. But I also was looking to go to a black cemetery in the South Suburbs to see Emmett Till, for example. And when you use the website Find a Grave, you can call a cemetery up and it will tell you famous people buried there. Mm -hmm. I used the Saber map to get me to cemeteries that were in the area that I wanted. And then once I plugged in and saw on the Sabre interactive part of it, who was buried there. And then I also went to find a grave. Between those two sources, what the Landmark Committee did with this grave map is it will tell you the name and if there is a photo, if there's a bio, like Jacob was talking about the bio project, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. You can find out all different kinds of things and then you incorporate the two. And it was astonishing what I was able to find, like the very first call up I made, there was Rube Foster. Mm -hmm. And especially with the Negro Leagues, it's a much more concentrated situation because black people at that time would only be allowed to be buried in certain cemeteries. So there was a concentration of all different walks of life in these cemeteries. I was seeing old time Negro League players before integration. And, you know, there was one guy who was the top black catcher mm -hmm. of his era who threw out Ty Cobb trying to steal a base. I guess Ty Cobb was like the mark to get, right? Mm -hmm. Someone in modern time made a plaque that sits alongside this man's gravestone that says, you know, he threw out Ty Cobb like mm -hmm. three times in one game or whatever. But as you're walking across this grass, you don't realize the lives and the skill set and the history of the people that are now six feet under and the grave map is a gift because no matter where you go in the country, even if you just go grocery shopping, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you're nearby a cemetery and you care about baseball, you can call up somebody and you learn about them. 
what I was so surprised to find out is when I'm reading some of these deep dive biographies, and I'm not talking about the standout players where you can just read pages on Wikipedia, Mm -hmm. but the hard to find players that you've never even heard of where they're able to give you the personality or the life history or this happened to them or whatever, the background. When Jacob said that Sabre committee members are actually going out and doing the research in terms of initial interviews with Mm -hmm. surviving family members, that just blew my mind. When I was reading these bios, I'm thinking, how did they assemble these facts? And I'm thinking newspapers and... And that's part of it too, for sure. Right, right. Yeah. But some of the stories that were encapsulated in these bios that I came across, there was such a personal element that told you about the man, not just the player. Mm Mm-hmm. I wondered how that came to be, and I think it's great for baseball fans and baseball historians, but also for the families, the surviving family members who are descendants who may not have even known Mm -hmm. sometimes that their ancestor was a player, to give them props. Yeah, same thing with the interactive map on Sabre. Again, not just the cemetery side, but the other map with all of the landmarks and plaques and statues and former sites of fields that used to exist, you know, yes, the polo grounds or things like that. I sent that map to my friends, Ted and Edward Holstrom, and Edward is a young baseball player coming up into his high school years and plays in travel tournaments all over the East Coast. And so they go on trips all the time Mm -hmm. to go play in tournaments or go do other things or, you know, in a couple of years, they're going to be making college visits. And every time they go on a trip, they send me where they've gone that's baseball related because they use the Sabre exactly, interactive map. Exactly. This will be part of my planning on any trip I go to. Yeah. And the best part about it is you don't necessarily need to plan ahead because you can just look up where am I right now? Right. What's within 10 minutes? Right. I've got an hour to kill. I don't know what to do. I'm in a city I've never been in. What baseball history can I learn right now? That's how quick and easy it is. And to me, that's the great thing about Sabre is that you can be as involved or not involved as you want to be. You can go as in-depth as you want to be, and you can become a member and write a biography and write a games project article if you want. Or you can just be a fan and look up something in 10 minutes and learn something, and cool, now you're done. It's a great organization to be a part of. Absolutely. And it's a slippery slope because the more you look up and just spend 10 minutes, they got you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're hooked. How can you not be? You already have the love of baseball, and it just goes from there. Another thing to mention that I don't think we covered in the interview is that you can be a member of multiple local chapters. You don't need to just pick one. So I was a member of the upstate South Carolina, the Larry Doby chapter, but I'm also a member of the Chicago chapter. I'm also a member of the Pittsburgh chapter. I'm also a member of the Cleveland chapter because... I've got friends in those chapters or they had events that I thought were cool that you have to be a member of to attend the event. So, okay, once you're a member of Sabre, it doesn't cost you any money to become a member of a local chapter. So you just sign up for their email newsletter or however they stay in touch. A lot of groups have Facebook pages or a Twitter presence. It's as simple as just clicking follow a lot of times. That's and right. Just because you don't necessarily live in an area, like Jacob said, a lot of these local chapters have Zoom meetings, or you can participate in the local chapter gatherings, even if you don't live in that part of the country. So that's something to keep in mind as well. If you want to join Sabre, you don't have to live in San Francisco to be a part of the San Francisco chapter. Right. Another key thing, which I wish I was able to take advantage of this past summer, was once a year having an annual convention in various cities. Mm -hmm. And being able to walk around that city and go visit the sites that are going to pop up when you call it up on the app. This past summer, it was in Chicago. Born and raised Chicagoan, did not know some of those spots, even if I did know of them, to go with someone who really knows about them. Mm -hmm. What a gift. Yeah. We did a, a walking tour that Jacob led, and he kind of did that same tour in 2019 for the 100th anniversary of the Black Sox scandal, World Series, and... There were symposiums, one in Chicago and one in Cincinnati. And so we kind of did that same walking tour in Chicago, but I wanted to go again. Right. (laughs) I didn't care. (laughs) I'd been on it. And so I reached out to him a couple of weeks before the Sabre convention and said, hey, do you need help with the walking tour? Like, you know, because there's logistics involved, it's, absolutely you've got a group of 60 people crossing a street. You're not all going to make it in the 17 seconds they give you. Right. So you're herding cats and (laughs) people are asking questions that Jacob might be answering. But since he's so far away, you know, we've got a Bluetooth microphone, 
but not everybody's listening. And so there's more involved than just Absolutely. being a part of it. So I said, what can I do to help? And he said, well, we're doing a dry run of the walking tour the day before the walking tour. So if you want to help out with that, we can figure out the logistics of, okay, we know we need to cross the street, but what side of the street do we want to cross? Because all of those logistics need to be planned in Absolutely. advance. You don't know what streets are under construction. You don't, you know. So I went on that walking tour three times, once in 2019, once with the dry run with Jacob and Tracy, and once during the Sabre convention. And I learned something new every single time, even though it's my home city, I've been on those streets a million times, right. I've done this research. When you go with a group of people, somebody's gonna throw in their two cents and talk about a story that you didn't know anything about. And now that starts a discussion and that's how a 90 minute walking tour turns into a four and a half hour walking <laughs> tour sometimes. So that was another part of like- And then there's coffee and then there's <laughs> pizza and then there's- And stopping at Billy Goat Tavern. And well, gotta stop at Billy Goat. So yeah, all of that stuff, those are the things that you don't think about. Do I join Sabre? I don't really care about OPS. I don't really care about field or independent pitching. I don't either. I don't care about that stuff. It helps color some of the greatness of these players, but I care about the history, the relationships. Exactly. Some of my best friends in the world at this point are people I met through Sabre. And that's what you don't consider, like Jacob said in the interview, when you go to a Sabre meeting or become a part of it, you immediately have something in common with these people. So right. that's something to consider as well. If you love baseball and you wouldn't be listening to this podcast, if you didn't, give it a look. It's worth doing. And as much of a niche obsession you may have or niche interest that you might have and you think you're all by yourself, you're not. Mm -hmm. When you are a member, you get a basically weekly email that Jacob is the editor of you need a cup of coffee to really absorb everything that's in there. And everything that's in there, there are so many different links to just about anything you could possibly want, including the bios, including the game recaps, but all activities or just all different things that are going on all over the place. And guarantee there's going to be something that is going to hit your niche. Mm -hmm. And there you go. Now you have somebody and you're going to get deeper into it and you're going to find out things you never knew. It is a great vehicle for any baseball fan to be part of. If you were going to write a Sabre Games project article about one game in history or read one if it's already been written, is there a particular game that you want to be able to research more? I like that you asked that question because some of the questions that you ask at the end of the interviews, I don't think you've ever asked me. And I honestly was thinking about that when you were going through the last questions with Jacob for this interview. You asked it in a slightly different way, which was if you could go back and attend mm -hmm. any game. Because those are two different answers for me. Totally. So I'll answer your question first. The game that I would like to research and do the game report on would be a game I attended when I was in grade school, and it was at Wrigley Field because when I was in grade school, I was actually a Cubs fan mm -hmm. because of Randy Hunley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. I went with the school group, but my dad was a chaperone, so I sat with my dad. And one of my fondest memories of my dad is being at that game with him. I have the program from it still. And, you know, I would have loved to have gotten an autographed baseball to Lori Love Randy. You're my biggest fan, I know. That didn't happen, but my dad knew that I loved Randy Huntley, and so he went to a souvenir stand and got me a souvenir baseball that meant everything to me, mm -hmm. but I don't remember anything about that game. I couldn't tell you who they were playing. I because don't know what happened. Because none of that mattered. It didn't. Right. So as an adult, I'd be curious, who were they even playing? Yeah. What happened? They lost 17 to three. <laughs> <laughs> but Randy really looked great. And, yeah. you know, so that would be the one. Yeah. If I answered the what time machine question that yes. you could go back and watch a game. I would want to see either a game with Thurman Munson or a game with Christy Mathewson. Mm-hmm. Another potential answer for that would have been the Ray Chapman game, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I would want to be there. Yeah. I think that was a horrible day to be in the ballpark. Yeah. So Sabre's cool. <laughs> what do you think of Jacob? <laughs> what did you think of the interview portion of the interview? The way I started out, he's a kindred spirit. If we ever go to lunch or dinner, we should just start with lunch knowing we're going to still be there <laughs> after dinner. So we need to go to a place that serves both mm -hmm. <laughs> because there will just be too many things to talk about. Obviously, we hit on all the wonderful Sabre things, and he's a major driver of that. Absolutely. And it is intense, and he does it flawlessly. 
But the other side is the Black Sox Committee and the work he's done with that and how he is still doing that work because, as he said, to this day, there are things coming out all the time. Mm -hmm. And there will be because of the nature of the beast of looking up something one way and finding something you weren't even expecting. Mm -hmm. Or as things get digitized and you used to have to go to New Orleans to right. look up Joe Jackson's stats from his season or things about where he lived or things like that, because the only place you could physically do it was at the New Orleans Research Center. Mm -hmm. And now as things get digitized, you can do that from your cell phone or your computer anywhere in the world. And so as it becomes easier to research from remote locations a lot of this information is going to become publicly available when it otherwise wouldn't. Right. I wouldn't call myself a genealogist, but I would say I'm interested in a member of Ancestry.com. Same thing. Every day, there are thousands of new records that are being digitized. So you might be searching for something for seven years and can't put your finger on it, and then all of a sudden, they got to it, mm -hmm. and now it's in your hands. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's the same principle with any type of research. But to be on top of it and to have as many members of the Black Sox Committee as there are who all are on the same page of what their goal is, mm -hmm. it's awesome. He's obviously so dedicated. You know, I can't hear the name Buck Weaver and not think of Jacob. Right. And that's been for a few years now. Well, I think you mentioned that everybody on the Black Sox Committee is on the same page. I think the page that every member of Sabre is on is what is the truth. Right. Right. We are doing research to uncover what really happened, not what are the tall tales, not what are the stories, not what have we been told for 100 years, what really happened. And that's the part about the work that they're doing, why it's so important, is you know when Eight Men Out came out in 1988, that became This Is Legend. Right. And now here we are 35 years later, and we realize almost none of that's true. Right. <laughs> that's why I hate, for example, reading historical fiction. Mm-hmm. I never thought of Eight Men Out the Book as historical fiction, but guess what? It was. Right. Well, it's funny because so many people would say, oh, the thing I hate the most about Field of Dreams is that <laughs> they've got Joe Jackson batting right-handed. Right. And I would always go, wait till you hear about all of Eight Men Out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because none of that is true to history. Yeah. And that one, you think, oh, that's the real story. Right. Right. You know, you know mm -hmm. that Field of Dreams is just a fantasy. But Eight Men Out was supposed to be the gold standard, mm -hmm. and it really is not even a brass standard. Yeah. I know you love Gene Carney. Let's talk about him a little bit. His newsletter that he would send out, which, yes. which Jacob referred to, was called Notes from the Shadows of Cooperstown, which I just always loved. I thought that was such a perfect... The phrase is inside baseball. If you know what's going on, you know what that's a reference to. And if you don't, you wouldn't even think twice of it. That guy... He was really amazing. When you think about as a person who is in my 60s, I've straddled pre-internet and post-internet, pre-devices that you can shoot something to a million people in one split second versus not even being able to use a Xerox machine. Mm -hmm. And he is doing this research and disseminating this information, and he's typing it out with two fingers. He had 10. But his nickname was Two Finger Carney yeah. because he would hunt and peck and type with the index finger of each hand. So that's, we, that's what you meant by that. Right. We needed the video of you yeah. just <laughs> acting that out. That was something. Again, thinking on a typewriter, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't have been an IBM Selectric 2, which was, to me, the day that was invented. I'm not kidding. I thought, oh, my God, this thing is the best thing <laughs> because all you had to do was back up and it would lift off your mistake. But think about what typewriters were before you got to an electronic typewriter stage. Mm -hmm. And some of those keys were hard to punch down. Mm -hmm. And he's doing that with two fingers, and it's not taking him a full day to do a paragraph. Mm -hmm. So it was a skill set. Yeah. And I know that sounds weird, but when you think about, first of all, there's no delete button to mm -hmm. backspace and make a correction. He's doing it on a typewriter. He's making all these copies and collating them, getting them into envelopes and paying postage at the post office to send them all out. So that's the after effects of all his manual research where you physically had to go to a research depository to look at the documents you want to look at. And he was doing this weekly. And right. it, it was multiple pages printed right. out every single week, right. sent out to dozens of people. <laughs> Yeah, and when Jacob was talking about his interactions with Gene, he was effusive, and the words he used were kind and generous, and 
I never met Gene Kearney. He has passed away. But somebody who's doing all that and still <laughs> is kind and generous to other people, that really speaks to the presence of that guy and who he was mm-hmm. and where his heart really was. And as Jacob described how Gene treated Jacob when he was a nobody, right? that's how Jacob has been to me. Before Jacob had any reason to be nice to me or respond to me or give me time or share his research with me, I was just some kid on the internet on Mm -hmm. Twitter, didn't have even a baseball related Twitter. I was just some guy. That's how Jacob has been with me for years. So he is carrying the torch. One of the other things Jacob was talking about, part of research and trying to find different things about somebody and they couldn't find an obit for Sports Sullivan Mm -hmm. until 10 years ago. Mm Mm-hmm. It is telling of the circle in which that guy traveled, Mm -hmm. right? And the control of information. And the same thing with Arnold Rothstein trying to keep himself out of the main glare of the spotlight and was able to do that. Mm -hmm. The people who want to control their image or control the information that's out there about them, they somehow find ways to do it even before the digital age. And speaking of the way that some of the players involved in the 1919 World Series changed their stories about what happened over the years, one instance that has always been interesting to me since I've learned about it is Ray Schalk. Within a couple of weeks after the World Series ended, he gave an interview to that newspaper that Jacob mentioned, Collier's Eye, where he named multiple names of White Sox players who helped throw the World Series, saying they wouldn't be back with the team in 1920. And Charles Comiskey basically called Schalk into his office and made him publicly take that back. So Schalk explained it away by saying that he was just frustrated with what happened in the World Series and he was just being emotional and he didn't mean any of that. But the cat was out of the bag very quickly. And again, to prove the point that Comiskey knew it happened, knew what was going on, and he was covering it up also. Right. But that happened. We've got the Collier's Eye issue where Schalk gives the seven names. He was their catcher Mm -hmm. and he was a clean sox. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with the eight myths out. And one of the things I always would think about as I would be discussing that with people was actually Ray Schock. Mm. The sixth myth about how the league and the officials and Comiskey, nobody knew anything until the grand jury investigation. As soon as Ray Schock makes the call for a pitch and gets shaken off multiple times and things are happening that he's not calling for, he knows. Mm-hmm. That's going on in the very first game. Right. Jacob alluded to the point where Ray Schock would blow up in the locker room. Mm-hmm. This was a clean guy who was an all-star. Hall He's, of Famer. Right. And he believes that they're going to win the World Series. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that would be the case. It was interesting to hear Jacob's comments on that. Well, Red Faber was a great White Sox starting pitcher who won 254 games in his career. He won 20 or more games four different seasons. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1964. Red Faber won three games as a starting pitcher for the White Sox in the 1917 World Series, which is to this day a record for most games won in a single World Series by one pitcher. Mm -hmm. But he missed the majority of the 1919 season and all of the 1919 World Series because he had the Spanish flu. Oh. To his dying day, his teammate Ray Schalk, fellow Hall of Famer, contended that the Black Sox scandal would have been impossible if Faber had been healthy. The conspirators would not have had enough pitching to succeed in the plot to throw Mm -hmm. the World Series. Red Faber, by the way, was born in Cascade, Iowa, which is about 20 minutes away from Dyersville. So if you ever go to the Field of Dreams, I would suggest carving out a couple extra hours to take a short trip over to Cascade and see the Red Faber Museum, too, because that's also really cool. There's not a whole lot around Dyersville and the Field of Dreams. So if you're going to make the trip all the way out there, go the extra 20 minutes and go see this museum because it's it's cool. Great point. I'm going to go back to Ray Schock and his anger in the locker room. I can only imagine how frustrated he was, like ready to just lay someone out. If you think of what a locker room is today, you know that there are many people who are not on the team who are close to the locker room. Mm -hmm. So either reporters are hearing that or different levels of team personnel are hearing that. Or somebody walks into the clubhouse after the game and they don't have a black eye and then they walk out (laughs) of the clubhouse and they do. Yeah. And all of a sudden you've got questions that need to be answered. Yeah. But again, I just always thought whether the rumors were going on or not before, which Mm -hmm. obviously they were, Mm -hmm. he's the very first guy who knows this is happening. Right. It's not just rumors anymore. That's right. It's happening. Whenever I think of it, I think of Ray Schock being the very first guy who knows and there's nothing he can do. Yeah. What a helpless feeling. Right. 
Jacob and David Fletcher recently released their book, Joe Jackson versus Chicago American League Baseball Club, which is the never before seen full trial transcript of the January 1924 trial where Joe sued the White Sox for the back pay, which he felt he was owed by Charles Comiskey because after Joe and the other Black Sox were banned from baseball, Comiskey refused to pay the remainder of Joe's contract, which was a multi-year deal that he signed after the 1919 season, but before the 1920 season started. So again, we know that Comiskey knew that the scandal had happened. Mm -hmm. They lose the World Series. Nobody gets caught. He signs Joe Jackson to a multi-year deal with the knowledge that the series had been thrown. All of 1920 until the last week of the season happens. Nothing gets uncovered. And now all of a sudden, after everything blows up, that's when Comiskey decides, well, now I don't need to pay the rest of his salary because he's banned from baseball and he's a crook. Well, sir. Right. You had all this information before you signed the contract. And so that was Joe's premise for this lawsuit. Most people don't even know that this lawsuit happened. They think the only courtroom that the White Sox and Black Sox were in was in 1921 when the jury found all the players not guilty, even though they were guilty. And Landis then the next day decides, I don't care what the jury says, everybody's banned from baseball. And I don't care what I said to you before that, you're banned from baseball. And to most people, that's the end of the story. They don't even know about this trial. Right. And this transcript that has just become public for the first time is groundbreaking. It's groundbreaking. Completely turns on its head the story that we've heard all these years. So I'll put a link in the liner notes to where you can buy that book as well. Yeah. If you are in need of a doorstop, (laughs) it acts as both a book that you can learn something from and a doorstop. It's huge, but it's the full transcript for the entire trial. It's an unbelievable resource now. In addition to the transcript, though, there are recaps at the beginning of the book to kind of get you set with who are the players, no pun intended, Mm -hmm. what is at stake, and gives you the background and the information that you need to really fully comprehend what you're reading after. And then a small recap after that. It will be groundbreaking. And there are a couple things I like about it. Number one, facts. Yes, Big difference between spewing off to a reporter versus being sworn in and testifying in a court of law. And back then, even the reporters weren't necessarily giving word-perfect quotes. Right. It was, yeah, he basically said, Yeah. and now we have, no, this is literally word for word, printed out in quotes, this is what was said. Right. These are the words spoken. So you have the facts And with that basis, now you can draw your own conclusions, though it's pretty black and white what you're reading in front of you. So number one, it's in a court of law where there's no fooling around, there's no paraphrasing, there's no manipulation of words. And number two, it's so soon after the fact. Mm -hmm. So it's not like 40 years later or even 10 years later Mm -hmm. because memories do change. Mm -hmm. We didn't really touch on the fact that Jacob Pomerenke is a person. You know, he's just this entity that is the all-knowing Black Sox guy, but he's a baseball fan. Yeah. He grew up in Baltimore and then became a Braves fan and got married on the anniversary of Cal Ripken Jr. breaking the streak because it was the anniversary of Cal Ripken Jr. But it wasn't coincidental that that was. Oh, no. (laughs) So I think that's another thing that a lot of people don't understand or think is that these researchers and these experts We all love baseball, too. That's why we started doing this stuff is because we love the game. And it was refreshing to hear Jacob talk just as a fan and as a human being who loves the sport. Obviously, the last part of the interview was him being the expert. Mm -hmm. But the first part was just him being a dude. And that was cool to me. Right. The stories that he shared brings to mind everybody who had the great baseball collection that was so intact and organized until they left the house. And of course, the mom threw it out because, you know, she was cleaning the closet. Mm -hmm. But his anti bad mom story to that was his own mom making him carrot cake because that was his favorite player, Brooks Robinson's favorite cake. So then it's going to be Jacob's and mom still makes it for him. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty special. Yep. I want to talk about vintage baseball for just a quick second. Mm -hmm. I follow Jacob at Buck Weaver, and I love watching him post things about vintage baseball, and I loved how he described the hardest rule to adapt to. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I've seen that in action so many times with the vintage games. Oh, yeah. One quick story. As soon as he talked about how he kept getting caught unaware There was one point where we're playing and have a ringer team of college athletes come to play this ragtag, anywhere from 6 to 66 age of the members of our team. 
and we look at these guys and we're thinking, oh, we are really in trouble. These guys could smash the ball out of the park. But we know the rules. Mm -hmm. And we're used to playing with that rule. They are not. And it was the dead ball era. So they think, I'm just going to come up to the plate and hit a ball 500 feet. You cannot hit that ball over the fence. Right, because we're using the vintage ball from that era. So they're trying to just hit home runs, and all of our outfielders are playing a foot away from (laughs) from the fence and just let the ball bounce in front of you and catch it. And okay, you hit it really hard, but it didn't go out, and now you're out. Right. And all we're trying to do is just hit little dribblers through the open side. (laughs) So after the first few innings, we're winning. Yeah, because you have a 10-year-old on our team who's getting outs against them, and they're going, wait, what is wrong with this picture? But as good as they were at baseball, they were also smart. And once they saw that that was the strategy, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, we were toast. the next few innings didn't go so well. (laughs) That, 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 That apparently happened, yes. Yeah. One other thing. Gambling in baseball. The comment of, for 100 years, no betting on baseball. And now... It is so disturbing to me to watch any sport on a television, for example, and see all the gambling stuff. It is so distracting to even what is going on in the action of the game you're watching. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. And they might as well just put dollar signs over the whole screen Mm -hmm. because it's all greed. Well, it's funny because Jacob said way back when there were signs along the outfield walls. Absolutely no betting. And now the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field have a sports book. And the Washington yeah. Nationals have a sports book. And not only can you bet inside the stadiums, I mean, everybody could have with their cell phones anyways. Right. But now you can do it at kiosks that are sanctioned by Major League Baseball, and Major League Baseball is taking a cut of the profits, and it's encouraged. They want you to bet on Absolutely. baseball. Absolutely. They're not saying, eh, we know this is something that's happening, but we're not going to talk about it. They're saying, no, 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 come do it, please. Right. It's sponsored. And do it in our space so we get a bigger cut. Right. No blind eye. It's disgusting to me. I yeah. just, I don't like that at all. Me either, Mom. Mm. <laughs> Great episode. Nice seeing you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Here we go. Season three. It's going to be awesome. This season rocks. Seasons one and two were cool. Don't get me wrong. Season yeah. three, hopefully the wait was worth it for everybody. Hope so. Glad to be back. We're looking forward to the rest of it. Cool. Thanks, Mom. Yep. Okay, so that's it. In the introduction of this episode, I mentioned how there are a handful of ways for you to follow the podcast online. In addition to liking, subscribing, and giving My Baseball History a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app, please make sure you're also following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where we are at Shoeless Podcast on each platform. By following us there, you'll get some bonus content throughout the month, and you'll be able to interact with us to let us know what you think of the show. If you have questions about My Baseball History, suggestions about topics you'd like to hear us discuss, or anything else, you can reach out on social media, submit something through the contact form on our website, or email us at shoelesspodcast at gmail.com. If you want to send in video or audio recordings of your questions so I can play them on the show, that's cool too. If you have ideas for guests you'd like us to talk to on the podcast, send us your list. If you know current or former baseball players, managers, broadcasters, or journalists who you can help us get in touch with, or if you are one, let's talk. During our interview, Jacob mentioned Brooks Robinson, the longtime Baltimore Oriole who passed away on September 6th, 2023. Many people remember Brooks Robinson as the graceful third baseman who won a record 16 consecutive Gold Glove Awards at the hot corner. He led all American League third baseman in fielding percentage 11 times and in assists 8 times. We've all seen the highlights of him ranging far to his right, fielding a ball deep down the third baseline, his momentum carrying him over into foul territory, where he then makes a throw across his body all the way across the diamond to beat the runner at first. He is arguably the best defensive third baseman the game has ever seen. But the human vacuum cleaner was so much more than just a human highlight reel. His Hall of Fame plaque mentions that during his career with Baltimore from 1955 to 1977, Brooks set major league records at his position for seasons with 23, Fielding percentage at 971, games played with 2,870, putouts with 2,697, assists with 6,205, and double plays with 618. That combination of longevity and greatness is what helped him earn a plaque in Cooperstown, which he was honored with in 1983 when he became only the 16th first ballot Hall of Famer in baseball history. 
Brooks was named the American League's most valuable player in 1964 after the best offensive season of his career. In his age 27 season, he had a career-high 194 hits, which helped him achieve a career-best 317 batting average, 50 points better than his career batting average overall. He hit 28 home runs, which was five more than his next best season as a big leaguer. He led the league with a career-high 118 runs batted in, which was 18 more than his next best season. He also had career highs in total bases with 319, on base percentage at 368, slugging percentage at 521, and then naturally in OPS at 889. He played in 163 games, which was his fourth consecutive season leading the league in games played, missing only one game during that span. He won his fifth consecutive Gold Glove Award and was named to his eighth consecutive All-Star team a streak that would extend all the way to 18 straight All-Star teams through his age 37 season in 1974. Robinson was a force to be reckoned with in those All-Star games. In the 1966 contest, the American League lost the National League 2-1, but Brooks went 3-4 for four with a triple and a run against National League starting pitcher Sandy Koufax, who was in the midst of the best season of his career. Robinson also had four putouts and four assists at third base, earning MVP honors despite playing for the losing team. He led the Orioles to four World Series. The Orioles won the 1966 World Series in a four-game sweep over the Los Angeles Dodgers, and then made three consecutive World Series from 1969 through 1971. While the 69 team lost to the Miracle Mets, and the 71 team lost to Roberto Clemente's Pittsburgh Pirates, Brooks helped the Orioles win their second ring in a five-year span by beating the Cincinnati Reds in the 1970 World Series. In a previous episode of My Baseball History, we spoke with Warren Brown, who is the bat boy for that 1970 Cincinnati Reds team. Warren described the absolutely hopeless feeling Reds players had during that series with Robinson in the field. Brooks stole several hits away from Reds batters and was named the 1970 World Series MVP after hitting 429 with two home runs and six RBI. Brooks started wearing his iconic number five during his third season with the Orioles and continued to wear it until his retirement. The Orioles retired the number five permanently almost immediately after Brooks ended his playing career. Kansas City Royals Hall of Famer George Brett wore number five for most of his career, admitting that Brooks Robinson was his idol. Brooks started 20 consecutive opening day games for the team, an unbelievable run at any position. He won the 1966 Lou Gehrig Memorial Award, the 1970 American League Babe Ruth Award, the 1972 Commissioner's Trophy, which is now known as the Roberto Clemente Award, and the 1977 Joe Cronin Award for significant achievement by an American League player. Brooks was part of the inaugural class of the Baltimore Orioles Hall of Fame in 1977, along with teammate and fellow Baseball Hall of Famer Frank Robinson. As great of a player as Brooks Robinson was, many people say he was an even better person. When you take a look back at everything he accomplished on the field, that's quite a statement. Don't forget, it's a huge help when you guys rate and review the show on whatever platform you choose to listen. Five-star ratings help our podcast get shown on more people's suggested podcast pages, which means more people will hear our show. It just takes a couple seconds of your time, but it really helps us a lot. And of course, liking us on social media, interacting with our posts, and sharing things with your friends is great too. No matter how you choose to support us, even if it's just by listening, we appreciate you being here. Until next time, I'm Dan Wallach, and this is My Baseball History.